a woman who chose to conceal not just one, but seven pregnancies from her husband and daughters. And what she chose to do after each birth will shock you even more. It was April 2014, and a man by the name of Darren West had just been released from a nine-year prison sentence charged for the possession, distribution, and usage of methamphetamines. He had come to gather the remainder of his things from his old home in Pleasant Grove, Utah. As he sifted through the cardboard boxes, he started to smell rubbing alcohol and strong chemical fumes. That's when he came across a box labeled Megan's Baby Things. Megan, Darren's ex-wife, had moved out of the home in 2013 while he had been away in prison. The chemical scent grew stronger when he began to move the box aside, and out of curiosity, Darren opened it up. He was confused when he reached his hand in the box and found something wrapped in an old t-shirt and plastic bag. To his shock, he found something that no one should have to come across in their lifetime. Inside the cardboard box was the lifeless body of a baby. Frantic, Darren called Megan demanding an explanation to what he had just found. While speaking over the phone, she admitted to having a miscarriage years ago. She said she didn't know what to do at the time and became scared. She hid the child, planning to eventually bury it, but didn't know how to go about it without causing a scene. Darren was shocked, although not entirely surprised that Megan had been so forgetful. You see, for years, Megan had struggled with a addiction. It was originally introduced to her through Darren, who went to prison for making and selling it, as mentioned earlier. Megan seemed entirely emotionally disconnected. Darren hung up on her shortly after. He had no idea how to handle this. He called the police. They arrived shortly after. When the police were notified of what Darren had found, they immediately brought in Megan for questioning. To everyone's shock, Megan seemed unfazed by this. She told the same story to the authorities that she had told Darren, that she had a miscarriage and gave birth at home. She freaked out, hid the baby, and had planned to bury it at some point, but never did. Police asked if there were any other bodies hidden in the garage. Megan seemed to take a ballpark guess, saying that there were about eight to nine deceased infants stashed away in the garage. They did not find nine babies, However, it's still heartbreaking to confirm that they did indeed find seven more babies. In total, there were five baby girls and two baby boys stashed and wrapped in various boxes in the garage. When police relayed this information to Megan, her response was pure confusion. She claimed she did not remember entirely how many there were, but didn't realize there were that many. Autopsy results revealed that only one of the babies was actually a stillborn. The rest had only lived for a few minutes before being suffocated. After police brought this information to Megan, she confessed that she had brought her newborns to their death. She seemed cold and unattached when sharing that she had given birth to these babies over the span of a decade from 1996 to 2006. What's even more unsettling is that Megan seemed to believe her reasoning for sealing the fate of these newborns was valid. She was very matter of fact in explaining that she was heavily addicted to and alcohol at the time and that she was not in a good place mentally or financially to raise them. But what was so confusing about this was that Megan was already a mom to three girls. Did she just tap out as a parent once her addiction began? Megan claimed that the only reason she kept her youngest daughter was because too many people knew about the pregnancy, including Darren. She went through with the pregnancy, even though she was struggling with addiction at the time. Man, my heart really breaks for her youngest daughter in hearing this reasoning. I hope she has been able to heal through that reality. It is so strange that Megan seemed to have so many other options to avoid continually giving birth and disposing of her newborns birth control, abortion, and the laws in the state she lived. The state of Utah is considered a safe haven state. This means that a parent can surrender a child into state custody with no questions asked. Megan revealed her process once she neared her due date, which was even more shocking. 
When getting contractions, she would lock herself in a bathroom in the house and give birth in the bathtub. She would then take the newborn baby in her hands and press on their necks with her thumbs until they lost consciousness. She would swaddle them in old towels or sweaters, wrap them up again in a garage bag, pour chemicals over it to hide the scent of decaying flesh, and pack them into cardboard boxes. She would stuff them behind the boxes of Christmas ornaments and old kids' toys. I don't know, it seems like she seems to find some kind of satisfaction in it, if you ask me. Because or not, this lady was not right in the head. Darren claimed to not know about any of this. However, since he was heavily addicted to drugs during this time, he is unsure of what really was communicated between him and Megan. During the time of Megan's pregnancies, he was unaware of what was going on in his daily life, though he did admit to know about two of the pregnancies. After DNA testing, it was confirmed that Darren was in fact the father to every single one of these babies. However, he is not considered a suspect of the crimes committed. Like, you'd think he would be a suspect due to his involvement, but he really was mentally not in a state to understand what was happening. When neighbors, friends, and family members were questioned, they all were shocked to find out that Megan had been pregnant multiple times and using drugs and alcohol regularly. Neighbors specifically said she seemed to gain and lose weight and was reclusive, but everyone was blindsided by her ability to lead this secret life. There were no records of her being admitted to a hospital for any of these births or receiving any professional medical attention, even at a basic urgent clinic. The prosecutor of this case believed that this was not just Megan on drugs or scared, but a sick and intentional thing, saying these were very cold, calculated killings. She was a woman who was remarkably, unbelievably, incredibly indifferent and callous. Megan responded back in saying, I deprived my little babies at the opportunity of life. I think my mind was just so out of it. All I was focused on was the next fix. She was placed in the Utah County Jail while the case was unfolding and was put on watch. She was severely depressed and it was a concern that she would conduct self-harm if left alone. When Megan went to her hearing, she refused to speak. She was stone cold, keeping her head down as her attorney read aloud a statement she had written, which read, My depression and alcohol took hold of me the same way did. I cannot give a reasonable answer of why I was capable of such a sick and heinous crime. I kept my secret for 18 years. Megan's two eldest children came to court with letters to read in front of the judge. In sharing what they had written, both girls defended their mother. They described her as the mom who always had dinner ready on the table, was present and home and very loving. These statements were thoughtful sentiments, but did not waver the court's decision. Due to the specific timeline of this case, Megan was not given the death penalty, though technically she was qualified for it. She had committed these crimes between the years of 1996 to 2006, which was right before the law was changed in Utah in 2007. This law changed the qualifications for the death penalty. If she had ended the lives of her children just a year or two later, it's highly likely that she would have been given the penalty. Megan agreed to enter a plea instead of going to trial. This was under an agreement that could reduce her sentence by about five years, but by taking this, it would give her fewer options for her to appeal down the line. On the 12th of February, 2015, Megan pleaded guilty to the six children she had suffocated and hid for years. Megan was held on a $6 million bail, $1 million for each baby, and sentenced to 15 years. Her parole was set for April of 2064. She will be 89 years old. It's believed that she will probably spend the rest of her life behind bars. What do you guys think? Do you think it was the addiction that drove her to do this or her mental health? Phew, that was a lot. Just when you think you've seen it all. These cases never fail to shock me. This has been Killer Bites. My name is Brandy. Thanks for watching.
All right, a Canadian college girl named Elisa decided to take a solo trip to California to escape her busy school life. But instead of returning home on a round trip ticket, this chick ended up getting a one-way ticket to you know where. She was found three weeks after her disappearance, floating in the hotel water tank by a maintenance guy after guests complained about the weird tasting water coming through their faucets. Wait, not everyone likes their water with a hint of corpse flavoring? On January 26th, Elisa checked into the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, and that was her first mistake. She was supposed to stay in a shared hostel style room, but was moved to a private room after her random roommates complained to the hotel staff about Elisa's odd behavior. Well, that's one way to get a hotel room upgrade. Just start tweaking out a bit and voila. Elisa's parents were nervous to let her go on a vacation alone, so they had her call them every day to check in. Ah yes, they are those parents. Hi mom. No, I'm fine. You don't need to keep checking in on me. <laughs> it's not like something bad's gonna happen and I'm gonna end up on a true crime mystery cooking show. Well, Elisa was supposed to check out of her room on January 31st, but if there's one thing I learned in college, it's that not everything works out as planned. Like, just because people say they're gonna split the Uber with you doesn't mean they're actually gonna hit you with the Venmo. And in Elisa's case, she never checked out of her room as scheduled. At this point, Elisa's helicopter parents are starting to freak because they hadn't heard from their daughter. So they did what any concerned parents would do and called the cops. Now, normally I would say they were overreacting, but in this case, their concerns were justified. The police arrived at the hotel and searched for Elisa, but they couldn't find her anywhere. Oh, I'm absolutely sure her parents were flipping out at this point. All right, so the next move for the investigators was to check the surveillance footage from the hotel cameras. And here's where shit gets cray. Homegirl had a full on exorcism or spiritual experience or something along those lines. In the video footage, Elisa is seen getting into an elevator and pressing all the buttons. Okay, but everyone's done that at least once in their lives, or had at least thought about it. Like, those buttons are just begging to be pressed. But here's the weird part. When the doors don't close, Elisa sticks her head out and looks around. And for the next two and a half minutes, she goes back and forth between peeking out into the hallway, waving to no one, making other weird gestures, and backing herself into the corner of the elevator. Then she steps out of the elevator all the way and is not seen again after that. What I want to know is what were the hotel security guards doing while all this was going on? Like, was there no one there reviewing the footage in real time who could have checked in on the situation? And how was there no one else in the hallway or near the elevator to see this go down? Like, everyone knows hotel elevators are one of the best spots for prime people watching. Well, not much happened in Elisa's case until February 19th when her body was found. This is three weeks after her initial disappearance. Oh, and might I mention, she was discovered on the hotel premises by a maintenance guy. So I guess the police officer's search wasn't as thorough as it could have been. Like, is that not a little embarrassing that these investigators dedicated three weeks of their lives to tracking down Elisa and an hourly employee at the hotel found her in one day? But anyways, back to the story. Elisa's body was discovered floating in a cylindrical four by eight foot water tank on the roof of the hotel. She didn't have any clothing on either. And after she was spotted by the maintenance guy, the tank actually had to be drained and cut open on the side to get her out. Also, let's take a moment to address the fact that she was literally floating in the water tank for three weeks. Whew, that must have smelled bad. And it probably didn't help the people who did the autopsy on Elisa. Like, I just imagine their boss coming in and being, wait, do medical examiners have bosses? They have to, right? Is it the police? Okay, anyway, whoever it was just came in and told them, hey, here's this girl that's been submerged in water for 21 days. Can you tell us the details on what happened? Thanks. And if Elisa's discovery doesn't already seem like a strange situation, just wait until you hear the reason she was found that day. Let's think about why a hotel would have a water tank on the roof. Numerous guests complained to the hotel staff about low water pressure. Some mentioned that it tasted a bit weird, and one couple even said that the water would come out of their faucet with a black coloring before turning clear. Wait, black water? Oh, I would have checked out of my hotel room so fast and left them a nasty Yelp review. Like this one time I was staying at a hotel and I was asleep and then someone knocks on my door at three in the morning. So I go to the people and I see three guys standing there and they say, we're looking for a water leak. And I was like, yeah, right, you're trying to kidnap me. So I went back to bed. Next day, find out that the guy in the room next to me was drunk, left his sink faucet 
it on and it ended up flooding down to the bar so they were trying to figure out what was going on. Let's just say I wasn't a happy camper when I found out about that. All right, so this black water drinking couple also mentioned that they didn't say anything at first because they thought that was just how the water in LA was, which totally gets LA wrong. We're known for being able to see the air, not taste the water, duh. Elise's clothes were also found in the tank that day and there seemed to be no signs of another person's involvement. But have the investigators ever heard of someone covering up a crime? Happens fairly often, but they should already know that. After Elise's autopsy was performed, medical examiners concluded her passing as accidental. She apparently suffered from bipolar disorder, so that was believed to be the main cause. Am I missing something here? How would that lead her to take a dive into the cramped hotel water tank without any clothes on? And they were okay with ruling out foul play just like that? Like, they thought it made more sense that a girl would squeeze into a water tank on the roof of the hotel instead of being forced there by someone else? I'm not too sure about that. The coroner's office also mentioned that they couldn't do a full examination because they were unable to analyze the fluid from her decomposing body. Yeah, floating in the water for 21 days will do that to a person. Dang, this is getting more confusing by the minute. Elisa was reportedly on medication for her bipolar disorder, and at the time of her autopsy, examiners found traces of her stimulant meds, but not her stabilizers. This led the coroners to believe that Elisa's lack of proper medication caused her to hallucinate or experience a manic episode of sorts, where she may have believed someone was following her. So this might explain her unique elevator activity, but how does that connect to casually sneaking into the water tank? Investigators theorize that Elisa's hallucination could have led her to hide from her imaginary enemy in the water tank for safety. But a lot of people didn't buy this idea, including some of the hotel employees, Elisa's family, and random people on the internet who followed her case. According to the CISA hotel staff, the water tank Elisa was discovered in is not easy to get to. It's on the private area of the hotel roof that can only be accessed by employee keys. And even though there's a fire escape that Elisa could have used to get to the roof, alarms would have gone off, which they never did. She also would have to get on a ladder to reach the water tank door, and there were none found in the area that night. As if it wasn't already clear that this theory is faulty, the door to the water tank was closed upon her discovery, which couldn't have been done solo. So this is leading me to believe that one of the hotel employees did this. Maybe they were mad she got a free room upgrade or she left her room a bit messy for the maid. I mean, that seems more logical to me than hallucinating an entire person chasing her around the hotel. And I'm not the only one who thinks this whole situation is sketchy. Because after Elisa's creepy elevator video was released to the public, it popped off. And by that, I mean it got over 3 million views in less than two weeks. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe to my elevator video, thanks! Her case gained a large public following and people started coming up with theories of their own. Here are some of the most popular ones. Elisa had one too many drinks or was on a hallucinogen, which she was a 21 year old college student, so that would make sense. And although there were no additional substances or traces of alcohol found in her system to validate this theory, some people thought she could have taken a rare cocktail that wouldn't appear on a standard toxicology screening. The next theory? Ghosts. Yep, everyone knows all hotels are haunted, and the Cecil Hotel has a history of spine-chilling occurrences that would lead to spirits roaming the halls that may have tormented Elisa. I did not mess with ghosts. One time when I was little, my mom brought me and my sisters over to her coworker's house in the middle of the night to look for ghosts. Like, they literally set up all the equipment and everything, and I swear to you that there was a little girl ghost there messing with the blinds because no one else was over there and they were moving. And I'm still traumatized to this day. Also, what mom brings their little girl over to a ghost hunting excursion. Love you, mom. Another popular theory has to do with another person being involved. Since the autopsy wasn't very thorough, some people believe there could have been physical abuse that was not accounted for. They thought there may have been an actual person Elisa was trying to escape from who eventually led her to the roof and wiped her out by forcing her into the tank. I'm no professional, but this seems to make more sense than the hallucination thing. Oh, and here's one of my favorite theories. Elisa was frustrated with the elevator's malfunction. There's not much else to that theory to explain how she ended up in the tank, but I couldn't not mention it. Like, it really do be like that sometimes. Those buttons can be annoying. But the mysteries don't stop there. Since Elisa's passing, posts had been shared on her Tumblr account, and while these could have been scheduled posts, her phone was not found near the tank or in her room at the time of her discovery. Someone definitely could have snatched up her phone and kept things fresh on her feed. Hey, gotta keep those followers engaged. Woo! Did it! So what ended up happening? 
Nothing, really. A few months after Elisa's discovery, her parents filed a lawsuit against the hotel owners. It claimed the hotel failed to protect their child by giving her access to the rooftop. But two years later, the suit was dismissed, and there have been no more advancements made in Elisa's case. But there was a Netflix series made about it that's been a hot topic amongst Netflix watchers, aka just about everyone in the world. I'm still stuck on the fact that medical examiners were so quick to claim that Elisa's big adios was an accident. Literally nothing about it seems like an accident to me. Like, here, let me accidentally hide in the corner of the elevator, sneak into a restricted area of the hotel without setting off any alarms, magically fly to the water tank door and take a plunge. Also, isn't there a hotel pool to do that in? So I'm leaning more towards the ghost theory because multiple people have purposely and accidentally passed away at the Cecil Hotel. There have also been at least two mass executioners who lived there, including Richard Ramirez, AKA the Night Stalker, who was known for knocking out at least 13 women in the 80s. Apparently people at the hotel would see him come back covered in vital fluid and not do anything about it. Uh, don't you think you should call the police or at least kick him out of his room? But at the same time, the staff probably didn't want to kick him out because if they did, they may have become his next victims. Ooh, or maybe some of them actually were his victims. Another famous slayer who lived at the hotel for a bit was Jack Unterberger, who terminated at least three people in LA during his time there. And after that, he went on to slay nine more people. If you do the math, that's at least 12 people, which is a lot. And the dude was staying at the hotel during some of them. Oh, also, Elizabeth Short, who was the victim of the famous Black Dahlia execution, was allegedly seen at the hotel bar shortly before she was knocked out. But that's not even a touch of the crazy shit that's gone down at the Cecil Hotel. In 1962, one woman jumped out of the window on the ninth floor, landed on another person who was walking on the street, and took them out with her. Okay, it's bad enough that this woman jumped to her own demise, but to take a random stranger out with her is just selfish. They didn't ask for that. Also, what are the odds that of all the places this girl lands, it's on another human? And did the person she fell on not hear or see her coming? Like, the woman had to be screaming or something. Oh, and get this. One of the old hotel managers claims that 80 people had passed away in the 10 years she worked there from 2007 to 2017. 80 people in 10 years. And that was pretty recent too. So I can't imagine how many people have zonked out at the hotel in total. And it makes me wonder why the manager stayed there so long. All these people kicking the bucket had to have taken a toll on her, unless she had something to do with some of them. So the hotel is currently closed, but plans to reopen in the future. And the moment they open, I'm booking a room. Oh, maybe I can channel Elisa and ask her what really happened because I am still baffled about her whole disappearance. Well, I could go on forever about the Cecil Hotel, but I also have this cake to eat. You know what would go well with this? A tall glass of black water. Today on Killer Bites, I'm going to tell you about one of the saddest, most preventable cases on our channel, in my opinion. Timothy Jones Jr., father of five children, let his ego and abusive nature take over and ruin the lives of everyone around him. Just a quick warning, we will be discussing topics of child abuse. Feel free to skip this one or fast forward through the parts where I discuss it if that makes you feel uncomfortable. So without further ado, let's jump into our story. In cases like these, we often look to the parents and upbringing of the criminal. Oftentimes, we can pinpoint the incidents that contributed to someone's mental health, ultimately leading them to commit acts of violence against others. Timothy Jones Jr.'s family was incredibly complicated from the start. His grandmother, Roberta, had to endure one of the most tragic upbringings I have ever heard of. She was continuously sexually abused from a very young age by her stepfather. After countless assaults against her, Roberta became pregnant at just 12 years old. Roberta gave birth to Timothy Jones Sr. and shortly after this was forced into a marriage with her abuser. That's right, her own stepfather. This is quite possibly one of the most disgusting and heartbreaking things I have ever heard. After five years of forced marriage, 17-year-old Roberta was ready to escape. Sadly, this also meant that Timothy Sr. was forced to live in the same house and be raised by the man who raped his mother. Once Roberta left her abuser, she had a lot of trauma to deal with. As a result, she began drinking heavily and found a new partner with whom she took a lot of her anger and resentment out on. On the other side of the family, Timothy Jr.'s mother, Cynthia, had a very troubled upbringing as well. Her own father molested her throughout her childhood. Too often, girls are taken advantage of by their own family members. This leaves a lasting impact on someone for the rest of their life. 
When Cynthia was just 16 years old, she met Timothy Sr. The two started a relationship, and soon after that, Cynthia became pregnant. Timothy Sr. described that Cynthia was a lovely woman, but things took a turn for the worse when she got pregnant. After this, both Cynthia and Timothy dropped out of high school to raise their new baby boy, Timothy Jones Jr. Cynthia and Timothy lived with Roberta about 25 miles outside of Chicago. Roberta disapproved of her daughter-in-law's behavior and often spoke about it to Timothy. There is this old way of parenting where when a child cries, the parents put them alone in a room to cry until they tire themselves out. They claim that this is a way to teach self-soothing. However, studies show that this can drastically affect a child and their ability to trust caregivers or show affection. Growing up, Cynthia did this technique with Timothy Jr. She refused to calm her child down herself or let anyone have a go soothing him. Instead, she would isolate him or bathe him in an ice cold water. Essentially, she believed that this would teach him to stay quiet and stop crying. Cynthia was prone to violent outbursts and at one point took Timothy Jr. and ran away. After this, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which put a lot into perspective. Timothy Sr. found her months later and took her to court. The custody battle began and he was awarded full custody of Timothy Jr. Cynthia was later placed into a mental institution and would not be released for several years. Timothy Sr. was around 19 years old and had to raise his three-year-old boy with the help of his grandmother because the love of his life turned into a completely different person. I can only imagine how stressful all of this was. I mean, you might think that things got better from this point, but sadly, they only got worse. Timothy Sr. remarried, but was violent towards his new wife. And Timothy Jr. witnessed every bit of it. They moved in with Roberta, Timothy Jr.'s grandmother, but she was abusive to her new husband. There was substance abuse use, alcoholism, and constant fighting. Roberta even attacked Timothy Sr.'s girlfriend at the time. The family was in a never-ending cycle of this poor behavior, and that is how Timothy Jr. learned to act with the people closest to him. Timothy was usually on his own. He had a couple of friends here and there, but nothing ever stuck around for long. He was an intelligent kid and had a knack for taking apart computers and putting them together again. Then when Timothy Jr. was about just 15 years old, he was in a brutal car accident with his cousin, who was driving under the influence. The car swerved off the road, crashing, leaving Timothy with a brain injury. And after the accident, Timothy became a different person. His father said, everything's changed. He was too smart for his shoes. However, things seemed to look up as he enlisted in the Navy. Unfortunately, Timothy was only there for six weeks because he was caught with substances, which got him immediately discharged. Timothy started to run around with the wrong crowd, drinking, doing drugs, and getting into trouble. Eventually, he was thrown into prison at the age of 19 for stealing cars and fraud. While there, he underwent extreme physical training and had to exercise on a super strict schedule. After serving time, Timothy decided that he needed to make some significant changes in his life. He stopped using substances and drinking alcohol, joined a Pentecostal church, and even went to college to get a degree. He majored in computer engineering and found a job where he could hone his skills and make a decent paycheck. Timothy was making a real 180. Then he met his future wife, Amber, both of them were not on excellent terms with their families and found comfort in one another. Timothy was very involved in the church when they met, but Amber was not. Nevertheless, Amber was drawn to Timothy because he had a job, went to school, and was very dedicated to his faith. The two started going to church together almost immediately. And in just a couple of weeks of dating, the two were engaged. The church they attended did not believe in waiting very long before marriage as intimacy was too enticing. Amber and Timothy were officially married in DuPage County, Illinois in less than six weeks. They hit it off and wasted no time, clearly. Soon after their marriage was finalized, they started popping out kids left and right. Timothy was offered a swanky new job at Intel, bringing in a much larger salary, so the family moved to South Carolina. They landed in a trailer home with three kids, and here's where it all started to go downhill. Timothy used his religion as a way to control everyone in the house, especially Amber. According to his religion, women could not wear makeup or cut their hair, and they were forbidden from working a job. So Amber had to quit her job to stay at home and take care of the children. What made this even worse was that Timothy cut her off from her friends and her family. She was dedicated to their home and him, nothing else. If she disobeyed or did something he considered out of line, he would harm her physically. Timothy would continue to get more and more violent as time went on. And in 2011, the Department of Social Services was called on him. A neighbor reported that Timothy was involved in an argument with a next door neighbor and threatened to shoot and kill his dog. A few members of the DSS came out to the property to assess the situation and check on the children. 
At the time, the children seemed fine and relatively unharmed. However, the children were utterly filthy. They were covered in dirt and looked like they had not changed their clothes in weeks. The home was a pigsty. Trash was piling up around the house, cockroaches were scurrying about, and it was not a healthy environment for anyone, especially their young children. The DSS reported their findings claiming that the children suffered from neglect and maltreatment with a substantial risk for physical injury. Paperwork was filed and a safety plan was put into place. However, just because an official tells you to change something does not mean that they will follow through. Things continued to stay the same. Timothy and Amber went on to have two more children. I don't know what the circumstances were to bring in two more. I am sure that there is more to the story. Yet again, DSS was called to check on the children and reports were made. Sadly, nothing ever came of these visits. The system expects the parents to follow through with these safety plans, yet they are the ones that are putting their children in the danger in the first place. There is zero accountability, all done through an honor system. Often, Amber made calls to the DSS because she feared for her life. Timothy treated her like garbage and tossed her around constantly. He spit on her in front of the children, threatened her with her life by snapping her neck, and headbutted her so hard that she even blacked out. Stuff like that sticks with you like forever. One time, the entire family was in the car following an argument. Timothy was driving and wanted to terrify Amber and the children, so he swerved into oncoming traffic, laughing, asking if they wanted to play chicken. After listening to their screams, begging to come back to the right side of the road, he barely escaped the accident with an oncoming vehicle. That sounds psychotic. He wanted complete control at all times, and the only way he could secure it was through fear. That's gross. The following year, Amber started up a relationship with a neighbor. Timothy and Amber were going through a massive rough patch in their marriage and decided to separate for a couple of weeks. They believed the time apart would give them space to think. However, when Timothy returned home, he realized that Amber was putting the children to bed and walking over to the neighbor's house. Timothy could not trust Amber because of her unfaithfulness and started coming after her character claiming she kept the house a disgusting mess and using her difficult upbringing against her. Soon after, he had a violent outburst, packed up everything, and took all five children to Mississippi to be closer to his family. He filed for divorce, demanded full custody, and in October of 2013, their marriage was over. Amber had no job, no friends or family to help, and no way to support the kids. Sadly, she agreed to give Timothy full custody. The affidavit said, Mr. Jones is a highly intelligent, responsible father who is capable of caring for his children as the sole custodial parent. His thoughts are very detailed, action-oriented, and focused on his children. Eventually, Timothy and the five kids moved back into the trailer in South Carolina. Amber had moved out by this time. He hired a babysitter to help take care of the kids because, well, five kids is a lot of kids. Even though Timothy had kind of sworn off substances and alcohol at one point in his life, it was back in full force. He took a significant hit to his ego and needed someone to take his frustrations out on. Well, Amber was gone, and the next best thing was his kids. Timothy became physically abusive to his children and made his punishments for misbehaving grueling. He would force his children to do high-impact exercises for long periods of time without stopping. He withheld food from the children, beat them, and threw them up against the walls, despite them being below the age of eight. It didn't matter to him. Anytime he would bring home food, he would just get one singular meal for all the kids to share. He left hand-sized bruises on their bodies, visible to literally anybody. Reports were made when the children went to school, but no one cared enough to follow up or ensure that they were safe. Honestly, everyone who filed a report and refused to follow up, I can't imagine how you sleep at night. No one wanted to do their job. You can't just stop at filing a little bit of paperwork. Children in conditions like this are like practically pleading for help. The babysitter did everything in her power to help the kids. She would try to feed the kids in secret because she knew that they would not get food if Timothy saw the meeting. She called the DSS, hoping and praying that someone would take her concerns seriously. Once a caseworker arrived at the trailer and saw bruises up and down one of the kids, nothing ever came of this visit. The department was called multiple times by child care workers and teachers, but they were pushed to the side each time. Reports claim the children were starving and covered in bruises and cuts, but yeah, nothing. Sadly, the abuse would come to a head. Hours before the brutal execution of Timothy's five children, surveillance footage captured him picking them up from school. The kids ran beside him and said, Daddy, 
Are you feeling better? Obviously, Timothy was having a difficult time and his moods were all over the place. A few hours after they had arrived home, Timothy found a six-year-old playing with an electrical socket. When he approached his son, he said something along the lines of, I want to live with mommy. This was the last straw. Timothy forced his son to endure extreme physical exercise without stopping as a punishment. Once one exercise cycle was done, he told him to do it again, over and over again. If his son complained or got tired, he took a whip and sliced it across his back. After hours of intense physical activity, the little boy passed out. Timothy carried his body into the bedroom, I guess believing that he had merely passed out. Unfortunately, he passed away from extreme exhaustion and dehydration. Once Timothy realized that his son was deceased, he started to panic. He began thinking about his other four kids. What was going to happen to them? Well, Amber would get custody. This thought enraged Timothy and the only conclusion he could come to was to end the lives of the rest of his children. He strangled his two oldest children, who were only seven and eight, with his hands. The two youngest, age one and age two, he used his belt on, and after all his kids were gone, Timothy had no idea what to do next. He ended up wrapping each body in a plastic bag, placing each into his car. Timothy told his babysitter that he and his kids would be out of town for the next few days and she shouldn't bother coming to the house. Timothy drove around for eight days with the bodies in the backseat, contemplating on what to do. It is unknown when he dumped their bodies. After this, Timothy was pulled over for driving under the influence. Multiple people had called in about the missing children and his information was in the system over a child welfare dispute. They recalled the car smelling of dried blood, chemicals, and the stench of death. Maggots, children's clothes, and bleach covered the back of the vehicle. I've never personally smelled a dead body, but those who have say it's a very distinct smell. And authorities knew something was up and took him into custody. Timothy was brought to the police station for questioning. He tried to plant multiple seeds throughout his interrogation because he knew the only way to get out of this unscathed was to plead insanity. Timothy defended his actions by saying voices told him to commit these acts of violence. Since his mother was schizophrenic, he assumed he was in the clear. Timothy's legal team attempted to claim that he was suffering from an extreme psychotic break and was unaware of his actions during the trial. Evidence showed a list that Timothy had created detailing how to dispose of each body, including CCTV footage of him purchasing saws at a local Walmart. He was entirely aware of what he was doing and was trying to save his own. All murder trials are challenging, but when it involves children under the age of nine, the air in the room changes. A chief defender said, I've done this for over 30 years and those are about impossible to look at. They are horrific under any definition. Here you have 12 jurors off of the street seeing photographs of dead children. I cannot imagine being a part of this trial and hearing the story in real time. On June 13th, 2019, after an hour and 45 minute deliberation, Timothy Jones Jr. was found guilty and given the ultimate penalty. Timothy is now 40 years old sitting on death row. The Department of Social Services had countless chances to put an end to the abuse. Instead, they filed their paperwork and considered it a job well done. Now five children are gone. My love goes out to the extended families and friends and I only imagine that this never gets any easier. That is all I have for you today. Until next time, please stay vigilant out there and stay safe. I'm Mac, thank you guys so much for watching another episode of Killer Bites and we'll see you next time. Sue Sharp was a 35-year-old mother of five. She had a 15-year-old son, John, a 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, 12-year-old daughter, Tina, 10-year-old son, Rick, and a five-year-old son, Greg. In the fall of 1980, Sue packed up her things and left her abusive husband. She left him behind in Connecticut and moved to Northern California with all five kids. First, Sue and the kids lived in her brother's old trailer in Quincy, California, but it was too cramped for them. So Sue and the kids relocated to a small resort town nearby, Ketty, California. Ketty was a town of just 66 people. Whoa, that's like the perfect place to quarantine. The family lived a nice quiet life up until what's about to happen. April 12th, 1981 was an average day for the Sharp family. The oldest son, John, was hanging out with his best friend. The youngest boys, Rick and Greg, were playing with their friend, Justin. They frolicked outside and rode bikes most of the day. Oh yeah, the days before we had iPads, Playstations, and TikTok. 
Those were the days. Justin planned to stay over that night. Sheila went over to the neighbor's house for a sleepover. Sue stayed on the couch watching TV. She was awaiting the return of John. But what happens later that evening will change everything for the small town of Ketty. At 8 a.m. that next morning, Sheila returned home to cabin 28 from her sleepover at the Seabolt's house. Upon entering the cabin, she found her mom, Sue, brother John, and John's friend. All three had been gruesomely knocked out and bound up with tape and wire. There was fluid everywhere. Sheila also saw what appeared to be another person underneath a yellow blanket, but was too frightened to look under it. That's understandable. Sheila ran back over to the Seabolt's house, screaming for help. Sheila and James Seabolt went back to cabin 28 to look for the rest of the family. They peered through the window and saw Rick, Greg, and Justin sleeping. Sheila and Justin tapped on the glass and told them to crawl out of the window so they wouldn't see the horrific scene in the living room. Tina was nowhere to be found. At some point between the initial discovery and the arrival of the police, James Seabolt entered the back door of the cabin to see if anyone else was there. Officers arrived at the scene and began investigating. Sue, John, and John's friend were all declared lifeless. I'll spare you the details of their state, but just know it was bad. There was no sign of forced entry, but officers did find a bent steak knife, a butcher knife, a hammer, and an unknown fingerprint on the back stairwell. They also noticed the phone was off the hook, the lights were shut off, and the curtains were closed. The three bodies appeared to have been moved and were wrapped in wires and surgical tape. Over the course of the initial search, five officers walked through the house before photos were taken. You'd think between five trained officers, one of them would know to not mess up the crime scene. Officers went door to door, interviewing potential witnesses until they realized Tina's missing. The officers didn't even realize Tina was unaccounted for until hours later. Like, how does that even happen? Tina was finally reported missing and the FBI was called in to investigate her disappearance. Investigators talked to Rick, Greg, and Justin since they were all at the house that night. The first thing Rick and Greg remembered after going to sleep was being woken up by Sheila the next morning. So you're telling me they slept through the whole thing? I wish I slept that good. Well, I guess not because I, I would want to hear an intruder coming in, but you know, you get the point. I have insomnia, okay? While Rick and Greg had no recollection of the event, Justin said he heard noises coming from the living room in a dream. In a later interview, while under hypnosis, Justin claimed he witnessed much more. Yeah, a county sheriff literally conducted a hypnosis session on a minor. According to Justin, he opened the bedroom door to see what the noises were in the living room. He saw Sue with two men, one with a mustache and short hair, the other with long hair. They both had glasses. Johnny and his friend entered through the front door, saw the men, and began fighting them. During the fight, Tina came into the living room and was snatched up by one of the men who took her out the back door. Does anyone else think it's weird that Justin went from dreaming of hearing noises to witnessing a full-on mass crime? From Justin's testimony, sketches were made of the two men and released to the public. A lot of potential evidence was collected on the scene, but it wasn't very useful in solving the case because it was before the times of DNA testing. Officials interviewed numerous locals and neighbors. The two main suspects were Justin's father, Martin Smart, and his house guest, John Bo Budibi. The duo matched the suspect's sketches, lived near the Sharps, and were supposedly involved in organized crime. During his interview, Martin said he was missing a hammer. Hmm. I wonder where that could be. Also, how did his missing hammer casually come up in the conversation? Do you know where your hammers are? I know where mine are. <laughs> One's in my purse. Martin successfully passed a polygraph test and was no longer a lead suspect. But this is where things get fishy. Firstly, the sheriff who conducted the polygraph test was close friends with Martin. Major conflict of interest there. At the time of the event, Martin was married to a woman named Marilyn. He was allegedly very violent to her. Marilyn told officials she was talking with Sue about leaving her husband. Martin and Marilyn eventually split. After Martin moved to Nevada, he wrote a letter that said, I've paid the price for your love, and now I've bought it with four lives, and you tell me we're through. 
That seems like a confession to me. But what would lead Martin to taking out Sue? The most popular theory amongst followers of this case involves a love triangle between Martin, Marilyn, and Sue. People thought Martin and Sue were having an affair. Yeah. This was all while Sue was coaching Marilyn through leaving her husband. So some people think that when Martin found out about Sue and Marilyn's conversations, Martin got together with Bo to take Sue out of the picture. But wait, Martin's letter mentioned him taking four lives. So who was the fourth person? Remember Tina? She was missing until 1984. The FBI conducted Tina's search for about two weeks until they handed it back to the local police officers to take care of it. Really? They gave up just like that? The case went cold for years until April 22nd, 1984, when Tina's remains were found. A man discovered Tina about 100 miles away from Ketty. Near her body was a blanket, blue jacket, pair of jeans, and an empty medical tape dispenser. After the discovery of Tina, not much else was found until years later. Here are the most recent updates. In 2000, Martin passed away. In 2004, Cabin 28 was torn down. Good move. I definitely wouldn't want to live there after what went down. In 2008, Martin's ex-wife, Marilyn, admitted in a documentary that she believed Martin and Bo did it. Well, yeah, no I could have told you that. In 2013, a recording of a 911 phone call was found at the bottom of an evidence box by an official who was assigned to the case. On the phone call, an anonymous person called moments after Tina was recovered. The caller identified the remains as belonging to Tina. The phone call was apparently never documented in the case. In 2016, a hammer was found in a pond near the Sharps cabin. It matched the description of Martin's hammer. Later that year, a knife was recovered near the scene. In 2018, DNA was retrieved from a piece of tape found near Sue. All of this evidence was sent over to the FBI for testing. Investigators are still working to find the perpetrators. There is still a $5,000 reward for anyone that has tips leading to an arrest and prosecution. What began as a fresh new start to life for Sue and her five kids turned into a catastrophic event leading to the demise of Sue and three others. After failing to conduct a thorough investigation, in conjunction with the lack of DNA testing technology and the fact that one of the officers on the case was best friends with the lead suspect, officials let the case of the Sharps slip under the rug for many, many years. Will it ever be solved? I'll let you stew on that. And I will stew on this. A woman so desperate for revenge from her estranged husband that she took the lives of their three innocent children. It starts with Dora Buenrostro. She was married to Alejandro Buenrostro, who also goes by the name Alex. Alex worked as an auto refinisher and painter. The couple and their three kids were living in Los Angeles all together like one big happy family. But Dora and Alex started to head toward a rocky relationship and it started to get increasingly worse. They argued all the time, big arguments, big blow ups. So in 1990, Dora decided she had had enough of the fighting and she packed up all her things. She took the three kids with her in the car and brought them over to live in an apartment in San Jacinto in Riverside County. They left Alex behind, but Riverside County isn't super far away from Los Angeles, so they were still relatively close enough where they could visit as needed. It's the nice crisp evening of October 25th, 1994. It's around 6 p.m. that Dora is spotted driving her car, a black Oldsmobile with her three kids near the apartment in San Jacinto. There's nine-year-old Susanna, eight-year-old Vincente, and four-year-old Deidre. Dora stopped and asked her neighbor David if she could borrow some cash for gas for her car. She told him she was strapped for cash, but needed the money to go visit her husband Alex in the city. Her neighbor, David, gave her the $10 she needed for the trip. Later that night, around 11 p.m., Dora shows up at her husband Alex's place in Los Angeles. She shows up unannounced and without the kids. 
From the moment she arrived, Dora was acting strange. She asked if she could hold her husband's firearm. Alex was like, okay, and removed the bullets from his firearm and then handed it to his wife. Dora inspected the weapon for a moment and then handed it back to Alex. Then he safely put it away and out of sight. As Alex was putting the weapon away, Dora took a knife out of the kitchen drawer. She was wearing red gloves and she was playing with the knife. She started making little stabbing motions towards Alex. Dora asked Alex if he was afraid to die. She threatens him with a knife and keeps creeping closer and tells him she wants to hit him where it hurts. You see, Dora was upset that they were no longer living together and that they're not a close couple anymore. And she had gone there that night to express those feelings to Alex and confront him. Dora took a few swings at Alex with the knife still gripped in her hand, but Alex managed to bob and weave out of the way. He managed to escape from Dora and leave the apartment to a safe location outside where he called the police. The police arrived around 1.20 a.m. They found Dora standing in the doorway, still wearing the red gloves and still holding the knife. Dora complied with everything the officers told her to do. They asked her to drop her weapon and she did. They asked her questions about why she had come to Alex's apartment that night and she answered them. Dora told the officers the reason for her visit was to pick up her youngest child from the father's place. She said she was upset that he hadn't brought her home from taking her shoes shopping. The police combed through Alex's apartment and there was no sign of their youngest child, Deidre. Alex told the police that he didn't have Deidre and that Deidre had been living with Dora and in her custody. Dora was like, no, I don't have Deidre. She's missing. The police told Dora she should go back home to her other children in San Jacinto and talk to her local police department to file a missing persons report. And Dora took off in her black Oldsmobile. Wednesday, October 26, 19 1994, 10.30 a.m., Dora enters the San Jacinto Police Department. She speaks to Officer Blaine Dillon. She tells him that her estranged husband has taken her youngest child two days earlier and he never brought her back home. The officer stated that unfortunately he could not intervene at that time because the child is in custody of its legal guardian. The police cannot intervene unless the child is at harm or if there happened to be a court order that forbids Alex to care for or see his children, but there was no such court order for him. He's clean and there's nothing the police could do for her. Dora left the station. She was next seen by her sister Angela at a nearby gas station in her black Oldsmobile riding solo. Dora had just gotten a car wash. October 27, 1994, about 3 a.m., Dora's neighbors claimed to have heard a really loud thump from Dora's apartment. Just one thump and that was it. At 6.40 a.m., Dora busts into the police station and this time she is in a much more intense and manic state. She is frantic when she tells the police that her estranged husband, Alex, had just shown up to her apartment unannounced and acting crazy and that he's wielding a knife. Dora explained that her three children, Susan, Vincente, and Deidre were inside the apartment sleeping and she's scared that her husband is gonna do something to hurt their three kids. Now the kids are in actual danger. The police can intervene. The police waste no time at all. They spring into action and make their way to the crime scene at Dora's apartment. Upon arrival at Dora Buenrostro's apartment, they discover the lifeless bodies of two of the couple's children, nine-year-old Susanna and eight-year-old Vincente. It appeared that while they were sleeping, Susanna and Vincente suffered knife injuries to the neck. Although the murder weapon nor Dora's husband were found at the scene, but for sure some sort of blade was used on the kids. They searched every inch of the apartment looking for four-year-old Deidre, but she was nowhere to be found. Now you would think that not being found in that apartment would be a good thing. Maybe there's hope Deidre is still alive, but unfortunately that's not the case. Deidre's body was discovered the evening of October 27th, 1994. A group of children were actually the ones to discover the body in an abandoned post office in the Lakeview section of Riverside County. Deidre's lifeless body was still strapped into her car seat. Both the seat and Deidre were covered in red bodily fluid. She too sustained injuries to the neck, just like her siblings, but her injuries came from a blade as well as a ballpoint pen. 
Although Deidre was the last of the children to be discovered, it was determined that she was actually killed two days earlier than her siblings. No murder weapon was discovered at the scene. No weapon at Dora's apartment and no weapon at the abandoned post office. The police decided to bring Dora and Alex both in for questioning together at the same time. The police went in hard for Alex, drilling him with questions. Alex told the police that he was innocent. He was at his apartment and then he went to work the day it all went down, so he couldn't have been responsible. The police said they would check into his alibi but this is when things started to get a little weird. Dora wasn't acting like a grieving mother of three. And who is to say really how one should act after something as traumatic as this? But something was not right. Dora was like giggling and laughing and making jokes with the police officers and even laughing and making jokes with Alex, the husband she claims is responsible for the death of her children. That is insane. Dora mentioned how tired she was more often in this interview than how sad, distraught, devastated, or how heartbroken she was. Yeah, so Dora botched the interview. She was super suspicious, like suspect number one. The police check in on Alex's alibi and he's clean. One of Alex's neighbors confirmed that she heard his shower running in Alex's apartment the morning of the crime. And she was looking out her window later that morning and saw him exit the apartment building, get in his car and drive away at 7.20 AM. With the distance between Alex's LA apartment and Dora's apartment, it meant there was no way Alex could have made it there in time to commit these crimes. So it's definitely not Alex. So now the finger points only to the wife and mother who has been weird since the get-go. Dora was arrested on October 29th, 1994 for taking the lives of her three children. The trial took place in November of 1995, 13 months after this all went down. The defense argued that Dora was not competent enough to stand trial, but the jury disagreed, so the trial went on. Dora, as the defendant, went on the stand to testify on her own behalf. She showed a lack of remorse for her actions while standing trial. She claimed that she was framed by the police for this crime and specifically pointed to Officer Blaine Dillon, the officer who helped her at the police station on the morning of October 27, 1994. The officer who rushed to her apartment in an attempt to save her three children from harm, from death. Dora's apartment neighbors testified that Dora and Alex argued a lot. They also said Dora did have very strange behavior and was very unfriendly and even a little scary. One neighbor stated that the kids were often locked out of their apartment and were only let in to use the bathroom. Evidence was brought forward that was discovered in the trunk on Dora's black Oldsmobile. They found the red gloves she was wearing the night of the 25th when she threatened Alex's life. The red gloves were covered in blood that DNA testing confirmed to be that of the youngest daughter, Deidre. Along with the gloves was a camera case and Dora's purse both of which were covered in Deidre's red body fluid. Hair was found on Deidre's body that did not belong to her, but it belonged to her mother, Dora. And lastly, they found tire tracks at the scene of the crime belonging to the tire tread of none other than Dora's Oldsmobile. The jury took 90 minutes to decide that Dora was indeed responsible for not only the death of her children, but also with the intent to frame her husband, Alex. She was charged with first degree murder. After the jury's conviction, Dora still carried on ranting that her husband Alex is the real culprit and she's innocent and that the police are awful and framing her and yada, yada, yada. After the verdict, she verbally attacked everyone in the courtroom, including her own attorney. Dora was raging and lashed out at the police, the prosecutors, anyone who would listen that her husband Alex was guilty and that she was 100% innocent. Even though Dora's mother, Arcelia Zamudio, begged the court to spare her daughter's life, they ignored her cries for help, and rightfully so. What Dora did was horrible and unforgivable. I can't believe someone can be so ruthless and cruel. She was sentenced to the death penalty on October 2nd, 1998. Thus concludes the crazy story of Mother Dora Buenrostro. That one was intense. What we can all take away from this story is that not all moms are good moms. And this particular mom is definitely one of the worst. 
I have almost no words, except why didn't Alex Buenrostro, the husband, go and check on the kids after Dora's little stunt on October 25th, when Dora was playing with a knife and trying to harm him? Or why didn't he try to file like an assault charge on Dora or try to get the custody of his kids? Maybe he was just used to Dora being weird. And maybe he didn't think she was capable of actually harming their kids. What do you guys think? And what true crime cases do you want us to cover for the next episode? Let us know in the comments below. I'm Brandy, and this has been Killer Bites. Heather Mack grew up in Chicago, Illinois. She was born to editor Sheila Mack and famous jazz composer James Mack. She was the only child and grew up in a very privileged household. At age 10, her father was diagnosed with colon cancer and passed away. And then there were two. Heather and her mom, Sheila. Since her dad's passing, Heather and her mom were said to have a very rocky relationship. Heather began acting out. She was skipping school and stealing large amounts of money from her mom. She got into several violent arguments with her mom that led to over 80 police calls for domestic violence. But Sheila would never press charges against her daughter. You would think an intervention would have happened somewhere after the fifth phone call, or the 21st, or the 73rd, but 80? Gosh. In an effort to reset their relationship on a more positive and healthy note, Sheila and Heather went on vacation to Bali. Because one vacation will make up for 80 cases of aggression, right? Sheila never left Bali. Well, actually, neither of them left Bali. One was knocked out and the other is in jail for doing it. Can you guess who did it? On August 4th, 2014, Sheila and Heather arrived in Bali. They booked a room at the St. Regis, a luxurious five-star resort. The trip was originally supposed to be just the two of them. But eight days later, Heather's boyfriend Tommy arrived on a $12,000 flight that Heather paid for using her mom's credit card. Oh, and I forgot to mention, Heather was pregnant with Tommy's child. Sheila had no idea Tommy was coming and was livid her money was used to get him there. She also reportedly hated Tommy and thought he was a bad influence on her daughter. But I don't know if Tommy is the one we have to worry about. But what happened next is much worse than charging $12,000 on Sheila's card. The morning after Tommy's arrival, he showed up at Heather and Sheila's hotel door with a metal fruit bowl handle in his hand. The next thing we know, Tommy and Heather are seen dragging a silver suitcase to the hotel lobby. They placed the suitcase in the back of a taxi and left the hotel. But the contents of the suitcase weren't clothes or souvenirs. It was a deceased Sheila Mack. After abandoning the suitcase, Tommy and Heather checked in at a nearby hotel without any luggage. Hmm, I wonder where their luggage would be. Well, actually it was on its way to the police station. Good call. Shortly thereafter, Heather and Tommy were arrested. They first told investigators that an armed group of bad guys abducted the threesome and took Sheila's life. But on Heather and Tommy's phones, messages were found that contradicted that claim. The text between Heather and Tommy revealed that the two lovers had been planning this event for quite some time. And this was six months after Heather tried bribing other people with $50,000 to take her mom out of the picture. In Heather and Tommy's messages, they went back and forth discussing the possible ways to knock out Sheila. They even referred to themselves as Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, and get this, Heather and Tommy used the phrase say hi as code to initiate the moment of the attack that day. Who knew a salutation could mean something so horrific? During their questioning, Heather and Tommy claimed they acted out of self-defense in response to Sheila threatening the life of their unborn child. Heather stated she was hiding in the bathroom when the initial incident occurred. Wait, I thought they said a group of mobsters took Sheila out. Also, how was it self-defense if the act had been planned for months? That changed quickly. So why would the couple want Sheila gone so bad? Aside from her not approving of the relationship or pregnancy, Sheila had recently made her daughter the sole beneficiary for a $1.56 million trust fund. Apparently Heather wanted to inherit that early and split it with Tommy at whatever cost, even her mother's life. After Heather's arrest, her lawyers attempted to gain access to the trust fund money for her. A judge initially released $150,000 to pay her legal fees, but after the official conviction, her other requests for money have been denied, aside from the necessities, including care for her child. Oh yeah, did you forget she was pregnant? In the end, Tommy was eventually charged for the direct crime, since he was the one who committed the actual life-ending act. He was sentenced to 18 years in a Bali prison. Uh, 
18 years seems a little short for taking someone's life, don't you think? Since his sentencing, Tommy has supposedly found God and is a devoted Christian. All I have to say is I hope he acts like it. As for Heather, she was charged for helping her boyfriend take out her mom. How twisted is that? She was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Oh, and she had her baby. Her baby Stella was allowed to live with Heather in jail for the first two years of her life. Stella is now being looked after by a woman that Heather first met when she was arrested. Talk about an interesting upbringing. But wait, there's more. Since her initial arrest, Heather has received several sentence cuts due to good behavior and is set to be released within the next year. So hide your moms. After her release, Heather will most likely be deported back to Chicago, but has already expressed plans to return to Bali to live there with her daughter as soon as she can make it back. And thanks to this story, I won't ever be able to look at a suitcase the same. Or be able to say hi to someone without thinking about Heather and Tommy's secret meaning. But hey, at least I can still eat cake. And now that I think about it, I'm gonna call my mom after this. Now, if you were anything like me, you probably imagine astronauts to be pretty smart, level-headed, and good-natured people, right? Well, I mean, they're put through some super intense training to prepare them to survive incredibly long and isolating trips floating in space. So then how did Lisa Nowak, an accomplished aeronautical engineer, NASA astronaut, and United States Navy captain go completely off the rails and become the first astronaut ever to face felony charges. So who was Lisa really? Lisa Marie Nowak was born in Washington, D.C. on May 10th, 1963, and she was literally primed to work at NASA. In 1985, Lisa graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. And after 10 years in the Navy, in 1996, she was selected by NASA to be an astronaut at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, qualifying as a mission specialist in robotics. That sounds pretty cool. I mean, you could say she was pretty freaking accomplished, right? And yet, to Despite her many accomplishments, Lisa Nowak, once described as an American hero of epic proportions, may only be remembered for that fateful night when she drove over 900 miles and 14 hours from Houston to Orlando in the wee hours of February 5th, 2007, to confront her ex-lover's new girlfriend after a devastating rejection. Yeah, you could say she was ready to go. So how on earth, or rather in space, did we get here? Let's back up for a minute. Lisa Nowak met the ex-lover in question, Bill Ophelein, in 1996 while training together in the NASA Space Shuttle program. And just by the nature of that training, they spent a lot of time in close quarters. Apparently sharing a desk and even once spending a week and a half together training for cold weather survival. But their relationship didn't officially begin until 2004. And despite both being married and both having kids, things started getting cozy outside of the office and they had an affair that lasted three years. During the course of the affair, Bill eventually ended things with his wife, Michaela, while Lisa stayed married to her husband, Richard Nowak, until they separated in early 2007. A few weeks prior to the infamous incident, Bill decided to end things with Lisa, telling her that he was falling in love with his new and younger girlfriend. An Air Force captain with an engineering degree named Colin Shipman, who he had started dating a few months prior. In an apparent foreshadowing, Colleen asked Bill how Lisa took the news, telling the police that she even asked him, is there gonna be some crazy lady showing up at my door trying to kill me? To which Bill replied that Lisa was totally fine with it and even happy for him. Despite the fact that she continued to call and text him almost daily, Bill later reiterated to police that it seemed like Lisa took the news well, all things considered. Well, as we know, Lisa did not take this well. Using a key that she still had to Bill's apartment, Lisa broke in and dug through his computer. And what did she find? Yeah, some pretty raunchy emails sent between Bill and Colleen while Bill was on a mission to the International Space Station. Just to give you a preview, the subject line on one reads, I need a rub down. To quote Colleen, first urge will be to rip your clothes off, anxious to get to you alone. And this one from Bill, I need to see you. I'm having Colleen withdrawals. Must see Colleen. 
This all sends Lisa over the edge because nobody needs to see all of that when you're going through a breakup. And in the midst of her apparent spiral, along with the emails, Lisa also finds Colleen's travel plans. And that's when she resolves to do what any reasonable person would do. Get in your car, drive 14 hours, and confront the girl that's stealing your dude. So Lisa takes off on her mission to hunt down Colleen, armed with, well, reportedly quite a few things, including a steel mallet, buck knife, a BB gun with ammo, latex gloves, four feet of rubber tubing, duct tape, garbage bags, a floppy disk containing images of bondage, a map to Colleen's neighborhood, and the only thing she actually ended up using on her victim was pepper spray. Crazy. She came in locked and loaded. She also reportedly packed, rather infamously, a bunch of adult diapers because she didn't want to make any pit stops and bathroom breaks on her way from Houston to Orlando. That's weird, but we're moving forward. That's how you know she put some thought into all this, right? Just think about like running through your house and grabbing all this shit. And then you take a pit stop at Home Depot for your mallets and then duct tape. I mean, that's not suspicious at all. So Lisa takes off on her mission, beelining it straight from Houston to Orlando. This drive is over 900 miles and takes over 14 hours. So she finally arrives at the Orlando International Airport after midnight, disguised in a black wig and a trench coat. Again, super not suspicious at all, right? And she's just hanging around baggage claim, waiting for Colleen to appear. Lisa eventually spots Colleen in the terminal and she sees her getting on a shuttle to head to her car. So Lisa continues to follow her onto the shuttle. As Colleen gets off the shuttle and starts heading to her car, she hears someone behind her and she can feel that she's being pursued. Naturally, Colleen started to hustle to get to her car a little faster and frantically jumps in. Because if someone in a trench coat starts running after you in a dark parking lot, anyone with half a brain stem is gonna be like, yo, I gotta start running too. So just as Colleen locks the door, Lisa actually tries to open the car door. And when she realizes that she can't get in, she starts asking for help, saying that her boyfriend forgot to pick her up from the airport. She asked Colleen if she could give her a ride or use her cell phone. Colleen's like, um, no, absolutely not. But hang tight, I'll send someone for you. Desperate at this point, Lisa starts crying and says she can't hear what Shipman is saying, which is when Colleen makes a huge mistake and opens the window, just enough for Lisa to spray pepper spray into her car. Luckily, Colleen was able to drive away and immediately call the police. And when officers arrived at the scene shortly after, they found that Lisa was nearby and she was trying to get rid of her disguise. And along with finding the bag of weapons that she had packed with her, detectives also said that Lisa was carrying a copy of those emails between Bill and Colleen. In the end, Lisa claimed that she was only trying to talk to Colleen. But it seems pretty clear from the evidence they found that Lisa may have intended to cause some harm. It's important to note at this point, Colleen had no idea who this woman was. She said that she thought that she was just a criminal doing a random crime, which makes sense. It probably seemed like a regular old carjacking. But a few hours later, while she was down at the police station, Colleen noticed a NASA ID on the desk of one of the officers. And then weirdly, she heard the word astronaut in the hallway. She was so confused by this, and she literally thought that this woman stole a NASA ID, not even considering that she was somehow connected to her lover, Bill. It's easy to laugh, about the whole diaper thing. But this all must have been pretty terrifying for Colleen, right? But while the media quickly whipped themselves into a frenzy around the more salacious details, everyone forgot to ask the only important question. Was Colleen okay? Since the incident, Colleen Shipman moved to Alaska and says she still experiences anxiety, migraines, and nightmares to this day and keeps herself armed 24 seven. So it's safe to say that this incident understandably caused her some lasting trauma, but in the end, there's a glimmer of hope because Colleen and Bill end up getting married. So I guess it was all worth it. They now have a son and live together in Alaska, writing the website adventurewrite.com, which promotes writing for kids, which is actually really wholesome. So I guess this part of the story has a happy ending at least. Lisa was initially charged with attempted kidnapping with intent to inflict bodily harm battery, and burglary of a vehicle using a weapon. If convicted, she could have faced up to life in prison for more serious felony charges. She pled guilty to a reduced sentence of burglary of an automobile and misdemeanor battery, and under her plea deal, was sentenced to only two days in jail and a year of probation. Lisa apologized to Colleen in court, saying she was sincerely sorry for her actions, and promised to never contact Colleen again. In 2010, she received an other than honorable discharge from the Navy. And maybe worst of all was that Lisa became a punchline for talk show hosts and news reporters around the world as the diaper wearing astronaut. 
even though her lawyer would later claim that she was never even wearing the diapers and they were just toddler diapers left in the car from when her family evacuated from Hurricane Rita, despite the fact that it was apparently Lisa herself who told the police that she had worn them so she wouldn't need to make any stops, right? Likely story. I guess the jury's still out on this one. In any case, obviously her career at NASA was over and she became the first active astronaut to ever be fired from NASA. As for where Lisa is now, well, she's living a quiet life in a modest home outside of Houston, Texas, where she works in the private sector. Understandably, she does her best to avoid the media, declining to give interviews on the disgraceful incident that happened more than 15 years ago. <sighs> that was a lot. And if you'd like to hear more totally wild scoring lover stories, let me know in the comments below and we'll see what we can dig up for you guys. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. My name is Mac and I'll see you next time on Killer Bites. Today I'd like to tell you about the story of Chris Benoit. Chris was a big name in the world of wrestling from the late 80s to the early 2000s. The thing about any type of celebrity is that we become so familiar with the person that we feel like we know them. So it makes it even more shocking when you come to find out that the person you feel like you know and love is capable of something truly awful. And the ending to Chris's story is not only shocking, but it's so, so tragic. Our story starts on May 21st, 1967 in Montreal, Quebec, where Chris was born. Chris's childhood was normal. Growing up in Edmonton, pretty early on, he developed a love of wrestling. There were two wrestlers in particular that he began to idolize. A British wrestler named Tom Dynamite Kid Billington and a Canadian-American second-generation wrestler named Brett the Hitman Hart. At 12 years old, Chris attended a local wrestling event where he watched those two performers and noticed how they stood out above everybody else. Now, he began to train to become a professional wrestler himself. He went on to the Hart family dungeon, which was a gym and a wrestling school located in the basement of the Hart mansion. Now, Chris Benoit began wrestling professionally in 1985. From 1985 to 2007, Chris wrestled professionally moving around from where he started in Canada to joining World Championship Wrestling and then moved between the WCW and the WWF and WWE for the remainder of his career. So also in that time, Chris went on to marry twice. His first marriage produced two kids, but by 1997, the marriage had fizzled and Chris began dating a woman named Nancy Sullivan. Nancy was known in the world of wrestling for being a professional wrestling manager and for her time in the ring as woman. She was also known for being married to Chris Benoit's rival, Kevin Sullivan. Both Chris and Nancy were in their first marriages, but when in late 1996, Kevin Sullivan conceived a storyline angle in the World Championship Wrestling, where Nancy, who was under her ring name Woman, was his manager and she would leave him for Chris. Kevin insisted that the two should travel together, share hotel rooms, and hold hands in public so the affair would look real, but the storyline he had created became reality. Nancy ultimately married Chris in November 2000, and as a result, and unsurprisingly, Kevin and Chris had a very contentious relationship behind the scenes when working as they continued to compete in wrestling matches. Now, before Nancy and Chris were married, they welcomed a son, Daniel Christopher Benoit. Both the birth of their son and their wedding happened in 2000. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't wedded bliss. While they lived in Atlanta, where Nancy managed Chris's career, their marriage also became a bit contentious, and in the May of 2003, Nancy filed a restraining order and for divorce claiming cruel treatment. But in August of that year, she decided to drop both the suit and the restraining order, and they continued to be married until June of 2007. Now, I don't know if you know this, and it might not be as common in current days, but professional athletes, and in particular wrestlers, sometimes take steroids. This might be for performance enhancement, some might take it for health reasons, but most commonly, it's known to bulk you up. So wrestlers are often the ones taking it. But the thing about steroids is they can have really bad side effects. And at the time of the incident, Chris had a very high testosterone level for a deficiency, possibly caused by previous steroid abuse. Now, prior to the incident, Chris had illegally been given medications that were not in compliance with WWE's talent wellness program. In February of 2006, WWE held an investigation and found that what he had been given was nandrolone and a synthetic testosterone and an nastrozole, which is a breast cancer medication and is only prescribed to men to reduce the production of estrogen. So it's commonly used by bodybuilders. But Chris wasn't the only one doing this. 
During the investigation into steroid abuse, it was revealed that there were other wrestlers who had been given the steroids. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in a wrestling match, these people are getting knocked around quite a bit, and they're probably prone to concussions and other bodily harm. Chris never sought medical attention after a match, which, why? Anything he had suffered from, he did it alone. And it's hard to say exactly what caused what happened next, but it's also hard not to think that there might be a connection between a brain that's handled just one too many concussions combined with the possible overuse of steroids. Now, and lastly, leading up to June of 2007, Chris suffered a few great losses, which contributed to his poor mental state. In 2005, a wrestler by the name of Eddie Guerrero, who was Chris's closest friend, passed away suddenly from heart failure. He was only 38 years old. The passing of Eddie was so hard on Chris that those closest to him said that he had never recovered from the loss. On June 19th, 2007, Chris wrestled his final match, defeating Elijah Burke in a match to determine who would compete for the vacated ECW World Championship at Vengeance Paper review that was happening on the 24th. However, Benoit missed the weekend house shows, telling WWE officials that his wife and son were vomiting blood due to food poisoning. When he failed to show up for the pay-per-view event, viewers were informed that he was unable to compete due to a family emergency and he was replaced. Even though Chris wasn't there, the crowd spent the majority of the match chanting for Benoit anyway. So, where was Chris? After he had missed the house matches, Chris was scheduled to fly out to the event Sunday morning and to be picked up by his friend Chavo Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero's nephew. Chris sent a cryptic text message to Chavo just after 3 a.m. Sunday saying, the dogs are in the enclosed pool area and the back door is open, followed by another text detailing his address. Now Chavo didn't think too much of it at the time, but Chris was a no-show at the airport and a no-show at the event, and he was scheduled to be at. On the Monday after, Chavo decided to show the text Chris had sent to the head of talent relations, John Laurinaitis. WWE had reached out to Chris to see what was going on, but there was no answer when they called. WWE then checked local hospitals to see if something had happened and if he had ended up there. Then Chris's agent called the police to do a welfare check. When the police arrived at Chris and Nancy's house, a neighbor suggested that she should go in first due to the fact that she could handle the German Shepherd since the dogs knew her because she would watch them when Chris would ever go out of town. The neighbor Holly walked inside and within minutes, she came running back out. She had discovered Daniel Christopher Benoit's lifeless body. He was only seven years old. Police went inside where they would find the body of Nancy as well as Chris. Nancy was found in the upstairs bathroom. Her body had been wrapped in a towel and with a Bible beside her. Daniel was found in the bedroom. He wasn't bound by anything, but there was a Bible placed beside him as well. And downstairs in the home gym was Chris Benoit's body hanging from his lap pull down exercise machine. Over a three day period from June 22nd to June 24th, 2007, Chris Benoit murdered his wife, Nancy, and their seven year old son, Daniel, before hanging himself. Autopsy results showed that Benoit's wife was murdered first as she was bound at the feet and wrists and died of asphyxiation specifically strangling on the night of June 22nd. Daniel, who also died of asphyxia, but was suffocated, had taken Xanax and was killed as he was lying sedated in his bed on the morning of June 23rd. Then on the evening of June 24th, Benoit killed himself in his weight room. Toxicology reports suggested that Nancy had a therapeutic amount of hydrocodone and Xanax, but the levels weren't determined to be high enough to suggest that she had been sedated. However, the Xanax found in Daniel's body suggested that he was sedated enough that he was asleep when he was being suffocated. And Chris was found to have had Xanax, hydrocodone, and an elevated amount of testosterone caused by a synthetic form of the hormone in his system. A suicide note wasn't found until much later after the initial investigation. In a Bible of Chris's, that had been sent to his first wife, Martina Benoit, and their two children in Canada after the incident, the handwritten note said, I'm preparing to leave this earth. No motive has been found. However, it is speculated that Chris had sustained so many head injuries during his lifetime that when tests were done, they showed that his brain was so severely damaged, it resembled the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. I mean, I guess that's what happens when one of your signature moves is a diving headbutt. Repeated concussions can lead to dementia or CTE, which can then contribute to severe behavioral problems. Though the WWE released a statement saying that this theory was only speculation, but we're finding out more and more about the long-term effects of athletes such as wrestlers and football players that sustain more trauma to the head, neck, and spine. Once it was determined that Chris had committed these horrific crimes, the WWE distanced themselves from Chris and the wrestling legacy that he had built. Only recently have they started to add some of his matches to streaming sites. 
And that's the story of Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel. It doesn't feel like I found any closure as to why and how he could have done such a thing. Let me know in the comments what you think. Did you grow up watching Chris Benoit? Do you think that this incident happened because of mental health issues? Or terrible trauma to the head? Or steroid use? Or, you know, a connection of all of them? I don't know. We want to hear your theories. What do you think? I'm Mac. Thanks for watching Killer Bites. We'll see you next time. In spring of 2003, 39-year-old Deanna Laney was your average small-town mom in New Chapel Hill, Texas. And in this lovely Mayberry-type town, Deanna was happy because she had three things she loved. Her husband, three sons, and God. A devout member of the First Assembly of God, a Pentecostal church, Deanna would attend every Sunday with her family where she sang in the choir and listened to sermons given by her brother-in-law, Gary. Her neighbors would comment that nothing ever seemed wrong with the family. No cases of domestic abuse or child abuse. They were just a normal, happy, and God-fearing family on the block. The Laney family had three beautiful boys, eight-year-old Joshua, six-year-old Luke, and 14-month-old Aaron. All of the boys would be zoned for the Chapel Hill Independent School District, which as of 2020, hosts three elementary schools, one middle and one high school. Because of this, it wasn't uncommon for people in New Chapel Hill to homeschool their children. And that's exactly what Deanna and Keith, her husband, decided that they would do. With most of the responsibility following on Deanna, of course, but even with all these responsibilities, on top of being a homemaker, caregiver, and still in recovery from giving birth to Aaron, her family said she showed no signs of stress or discomfort. Psychologists later on in court would suggest that there may have been some signs Deanna was suffering from at least depression, but her neighbors wouldn't catch on to it because her children were homeschooled and to a degree isolated from the community. Maybe that's why they also didn't notice that Deanna had been walking around their five acre property and talking to herself. At least that's what it appeared to be on the surface, but later in confessional tapes played during her trial, Deanna said that she had in fact been experiencing full on conversations with God. Deanna said that she was contacted several times by God himself to do his work. Deanna said one day she was in the kitchen preparing a casserole dish for a family event when suddenly she heard the most perfect recipe for her dish. She even turned and looked to see who was around because the voice was so loud and strong that it felt like someone was actually in the room with her. And then their conversations began to get longer and longer. Because Deanna claimed that God had begun to demand that she kill her children to prove her faith in him, much like he had done to Abraham. For those unfamiliar with the tale, in the Bible, there is a story of a man named Abraham who was commanded by God to offer his son up as sacrifice. Many religious people believe that God did this to test Abraham's loyalty and faith in him, just like Deanna was claiming he was doing to her. She said later that God was getting more and more impatient with her stalling, and because she was taking too much time, he began to demand that she end her son's lives in more violent ways, through either stabbing or strangulation. But Deanna's delusions didn't stop there. She even claimed that she believed herself to be like the second Mary. N not in the keeping a secret pregnancy from the Lord way, but in that she thought she needed to keep these delusions secret from everyone, because she was special, chosen, to communicate with God himself. She didn't want to believe these conversations at first though, but the signs just kept appearing. Deanna said one of the first signs God gave to show that he wanted her to kill her sons came while her youngest, Aaron, was playing with a toy spear near a wood-burning stove. Deanna recounted, I said, boy, what are you doing over there? And he turned around and he had a spear in his hand, she said, and I knew I was going to have to kill my boys. Deanna would go on to say she felt tormented and torn between obeying God and selfishly keeping her sons alive. But according to her husband, he didn't notice these changes. He said that Deanna seemed normal and was doing all the normal things she usually did. 
Deanna's sister Pam was the only one who noticed something was a bit off with her. She revealed in court that she only noticed small changes in Deanna's behavior, not going out to lunch as often, losing weight while appearing to fast, seen in certain religions to be a way to help focus your thoughts more on God and his teachings by abstaining from the gluttonies of eating. But no one reached out to Deanna because again, they said she seemed normal. Then, one day while Deanna was walking around in the front yard of her property, she tripped over a rock. And this, she said, was her final sign from God. She believed that he was telling her to use rocks, weighing up to 14 pounds, to complete the task of taking her children's lives. And on the night of May 9th, the weekend of Mother's Day, God called out to her once again and woke her up. After slipping quietly out of bed so as not to wake her husband, she went first to her youngest son, Aaron. Deanna picked him up from his crib and began hitting him in the head with a rock she had stashed in the room earlier that day. When Aaron began crying, she put him back in bed and placed a pillow over his head to muffle the cries. At that moment, Keith appeared in the doorway, half asleep, asking if everything was all right. Deanna hovered over the crib and replied, everything's okay. He would recount in court later that he assumed his wife was just changing a diaper and went back to bed. Deanna then struck Aaron again, and after hearing a gurgling sound from the blood in the baby's throat, she covered him up with a pillow once more and left God to do the rest since she claimed she couldn't do more than that to her Aaron. Deanna then went to her two older sons, asking Luke to follow her outside to the rock garden first. He did as his mother asked without question. She told him to lie on the ground. She began to bludgeon six-year-old Luke's head with a rock the size of a dinner plate. She struck him eight times before dragging his body behind a swing saying she knew this would cause her oldest son to throw less of a fit if he didn't see the body. But behind the swing, Luke was still breathing. So Deanna placed an even larger rock on his chest to stop it from moving indefinitely. Deanna recounted that at that moment, she told God that she didn't want to do this anymore, but in the distance, she saw a flash of lightning and took that as a sign that she needed to keep going and that her son Luke was finally dead. She returned to the house and brought Joshua outside to finish her job. He asked her what they were doing. She told him it was a test, but when the eight-year-old boy began to struggle against her, she knelt down on his arms as she continued to strike his head until he stopped fighting. She struck him so many times that his brain, the prosecution stated, started to seep out like a liquid. Deanna would tell doctors later that she didn't remember seeing their faces at all while performing these heinous acts of violence. Once she had finished with Joshua, she pulled his body next to Luke's, picked up the phone, and called 911. When she connected with the dispatcher, she said very clearly and void of all emotion, I just killed my boys. Officers and paramedics finally arrived on the scene and found the two oldest boys dead in their underwear. When they went to Aaron's crib, by some miracle, they found him still alive and breathing. They immediately rushed into the hospital where doctors were able to save his life. But unfortunately, he had such severe brain damage that he will never be the same. A pediatric neurosurgeon testified later in court that the damage of the attack was so severe that besides his vision being impaired for life, Aaron will also never be able to live independently. The officers searched the property for Deanna and found her in a small patch of woods and bloodied pajamas. Keith said he finally awoke with the commotion of the police arriving. After Deanna's arrest, psychologists were immediately sent in to take Deanna's statement, where again, void of sorrow or emotion, she recounted to them how she was doing this for God to complete his test. But after finally going on medication for those with psychosis, her talks of God stopped. And after being put on suicide watch for her new erratic behavior, it was clear to the court and jury that Deanna finally became aware of what she had done. In Texas, you can plead not guilty to a crime by means of insanity if defendants are able to prove that their client on trial has a mental disease or defect and that they could not tell right from wrong at the time of the crime. Both of these conditions must be satisfied. When Deanna's case began in March of 2004, 
Several experts testified that they believed she had been suffering from undiagnosed mental illness for the past three years. Deanna disclosed to her new psychiatrist that years before she had also experienced similar delusions. For example, she had hallucinated the smell of sulfur, which she took as a sign of the devil, and even saw signs in the poop of her infant's used diapers. The court also seemed to take Deanna's 911 call heavily into consideration when compared with her confessional tapes recorded six months after the incident. Because her mental state was so clearly different, the first showing a lack of remorse for what she had done versus the latter showing her breaking down and crying, they concluded that this was another piece of good evidence to prove that she wasn't thinking about right or wrong when she took her son's lives. However, the prosecutors made a good point that if she really thought that way, then why did she call the police? Ultimately, the jury found that both Texas law and the McNaughton law were satisfied and Deanna was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to a state mental hospital for an undetermined amount of time. Deanna's husband, Keith, filed for divorce after the trial proceedings concluded. After being confined to a high security state mental hospital, Deanna was moved quickly to Kerrville State Hospital for three years. Then in 2007, Deanna was surprisingly released. In a closed door hearing for Deanna in November, doctors came and testified that she wasn't mentally ill. But Deanna's lawyers did everything they could to find evidence that proved otherwise and would allow her to remain in a mental hospital. According to the judge and witnesses' testimonies, Deanna was seen to no longer be a danger to herself or to others. Because her mental state also didn't seem to be deteriorating, witnesses testified that there was no further need for her to continue inpatient treatment. Twin brothers convicted of murder, but did they actually commit this vicious crime? Today we're tackling the case of 19-year-old twin brothers Jared and Gerald Smith and the death of an innocent Samaritan named Nathan Halstead. Our story begins in the early morning of Monday, June 30th, 2014, in the city of Fresno, California, of the San Joaquin Valley. It was very dark outside. It was around 3 a.m. when a young woman by the name of Tennille Alexander made her way through the practically empty streets of Fresno. She stopped to wait at a nearby bus stop. A short while later, a man in a pickup truck came rolling down the street. He slowed down and pulled over at the bus stop right next to Alexander. Alexander was very hungry at this point, and she thought maybe this man in the truck would take her to get her something to eat. So she climbed in the truck with him and they headed down the road. The two chatted in the truck for a bit, but unfortunately he did not propose that the two of them get a meal together or even a snack. He only propositioned her for so again, Alexander said no and declined the offer. The man pulled his truck over to the side of the road. Alexander got out of the truck at the corner gas station of Belmont and Calaveras in the Tower District. She began walking back toward the next bus stop. This is where Alexander was approached by the 19-year-old twin brothers, Gerald and Jared Smith. The twins, Gerald and Jared, had supposedly been out all night and all morning, wandering the streets of Fresno. Obviously, they were up to no good. These boys had one mission in mind that night. That mission, trying to start as many fights as possible with literally anyone who dared to come near them. Alexander saw the twins and tried to ignore them and walk right past them, but she wasn't so lucky. One of the twins walked right up to Alexander, blocking her path. Alexander could see rage in his eyes. He demanded she give him money. The other twin was originally hesitant, being that Alexander was female and even made a very poor attempt to get his brother to stop and leave this woman alone. But his brother proceeded to rile her up and demand that she give them money. Alexander was frightened, but tried to hold her ground. She told the twins she's not a prostitute and didn't have any money to give them. The twin was very upset by her response. He grew enraged and began attacking her in the gas station parking lot. The other twin quickly joined in right behind him and began beating up this girl. 
The two were monsters, really, truly just brutal to Alexander. That's when a good Samaritan by the name of Nathan Halstead was casually riding his bike down the street. He spotted the awful scene unfolding in front of him and decided to intervene. Halstead rushed to Alexander's aid, jumped off of his bike, and then tried to pull the twins off of her and stop the attack. The twins ditch Alexander and then diverted their attention from Alexander to Halstead. They began punching, kicking, and stomping on Halstead. Meanwhile, Alexander runs away and gets the hell out of there. Gerald and Jared brutally beat Halstead for several minutes, the fight moving from the parking lot of the gas station to the sidewalk and then out into the middle of the street and taking up two lanes. Eventually, from the beatings, Halstead collapsed unconscious in the middle of the road, and the brothers took off. They fled the scene and made their way home. They just left him there in the middle of the street, Halstead just laying there helpless. It was around 3 a.m., so the streets were relatively empty, but as you can imagine, at some point, cars were driving on this road. A white car drove by during the altercation. The car slowed down to almost a complete stop, wanting to slow down to help the young woman in trouble. The twins walked towards the car. They attempted to open the door and like hit the car and was banging on it. Luckily, the driver's doors were locked, so they didn't get it open and they sped away unharmed. So Alexandra had run off. Gerald and Jared fled the scene. Nathan Halstead was left there alone. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before another car came speeding down the street, and this car did not slow down. Tragically, this car did not see the unconscious man, Nathan Halstead, lying on the ground. The car ran him over and ended his life. Emergency medical services arrived at the scene of the crime as quick as they could, but it was too late. They pronounced Nathan Halstead dead. But this is where things get a little sticky. Is the person who ran over Nathan Halstead really responsible for this death? Or is Gerald and Jared Smith responsible for this death? Because they're the ones who put Halstead into such a horrible state, rendering him unconscious in the middle of the road where he was susceptible to harm. Like, yes, the driver should have spotted the body and not run over him, but Halstead wouldn't have been in the road if it wasn't for Jared and Gerald. Seems like a no-brainer to me but not to Gerald and Jared's mom. Their mom, Luann Smith, said in multiple interviews that they are completely innocent and that the driver of the car is the one responsible. She said her boys were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Sounds like their mother is doing exactly what any other mother would do. She's protecting her kids at all costs, even though they are awful humans. Meanwhile, the authorities disagree with these claims, as did the rest of the world, I'm just saying. Chief Jerry Dyer was interviewed and stated that this is not the driver's fault. He did not. The people who are responsible for this are Gerald and Jared Smith, who were the ones that beat this victim and allowed him to be run over and killed. The officer has also commented on the scene after viewing the security footage and said they were like animals pursuing prey. That's what they were. If one person walked by, they went after them. They were ruthless. So how did Gerald and Jared get busted for these crimes? In a few ways, actually. Yo, get this. The whole incident was caught on a security camera. Yes, there was a security camera across the street just regular old traffic cameras. So on the tape, you can clearly see Gerald and Jared Smith walk up and attack Alexander at a gas station. Nathan Halstead is cruising on his bike. He makes his way over the four lanes and gets off his bike to help the victim. Then the twins drop what they're doing with Alexander and proceed to attack Halstead. You can clearly see them carrying the fight out from the gas station out into the street before running away. The twins' attorney, Daljeet Rakar, tried to argue in court that the security footage was too grainy to correctly identify the suspects as Gerald and Jared Smith. Alexander did identify her attackers, as well as acknowledge the bravery of Nathan Halstead rushing to help her. She's quoted saying, if it wasn't for that man who rolled by on a bike, I would have died. And she's not wrong. 
On top of that, the authorities tested for fingerprints on the car that drove past the scene that the twins then tried to target and attack. Remember when they tried to open that random person's car door? Well, they left behind their fingerprints. And thankfully, the person who drove by came forward and told authorities what they saw and brought the car in to get tested. Testing confirmed the prints belonged to none other than Gerald and Jared Smith. So all the evidence is stacked against Gerald and Jared Smith, but somehow it took like five years to officially reach a verdict and a sentencing. The crime was committed in 2014. The trial started in 2015, but the hearing went on and lasted until July 23rd, 2019. Eventually, the boys admitted to the crime, probably because there was really no way to deny it at this point. They were convicted and sentenced to prison for 12 years. The judge set their bail at $1.1 million. The twins were only 18 or 19 years old at the time they committed the crime in 2014. They were sentenced to prison in July 2019, and they are eligible for parole in 2032. Which is coming up, y'all. That's just too soon. What do you guys think about this one? Do you think Jared and Gerald are responsible for the death of Nathan Halstead? Or do you think the person that ran Nathan Halstead over with the vehicle is responsible? Let me know what all of you guys think in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching. I'm Brandy, and this has been Killer Bites. Let us know if there are any crimes you'd like us to cover in the next episode. In today's episode, we're talking about Lauren Ann Dickinson. We can all agree that the whole quarantine thing wasn't fun, aside from the endless naps and banana bread. But like the not having anything to do for weeks on end, yeah, that was tiring. And for those who were in quarantine with other people, there's that whole element of getting annoyed by spending so much time around each other. But would the struggles of quarantine drive Lauren Ann Dickinson to execute her own children? One September night in 2021 in Christchurch, New Zealand, a woman heard a loud bang that sounded like a door slam. After that, they heard the sounds of someone crying and moaning. Looking outside, the woman saw a man wandering around the street. He was sobbing hysterically. Another neighbor heard this man as well, and when she asked the man if he was okay, he didn't answer. All he could do was say, is this really happening? Freaked out, one of the neighbors phoned the police. The police rushed to the scene immediately. The man was Graham Dickinson, an orthopedic surgeon who just moved to New Zealand from South Africa with his wife and three kids. The reason he was screaming? He just found the lifeless bodies of his three children in his home, and his wife was unresponsive. When the paramedics finally arrived, they attempted to resuscitate the little girls, but it was too late. They pronounced six-year-old Leanne and her two-year-old little twin sisters, Carla and Maya, deceased. The cause was fairly simple to figure out, considering there were cable ties around the little girls' necks. 40-year-old mother, Lauren Dickinson, was also found in the home along with her three daughters. She was still alive, but needed medical attention as soon as possible, so first responders rushed her to the hospital. And at some point, the cops started speculating about who could have done this horrible act. Lauren was the only other person there, and she didn't have any major injuries, so it seemed like Lauren might be the most logical answer. On the other hand, what mother would do something so horrible to their children? But again, there was no other suspects or witnesses at the scene of the crime. After looking into it more, the cops were like, yeah, Lauren definitely did it. And within the next day, Lauren was arrested and charged with the crimes. This came as a huge shock to Lauren's husband, her family, friends, and acquaintances. She didn't seem like the type of person to commit such heinous acts, especially against her own children. One of Lauren's old neighbors said in an interview, I cannot comprehend what happened. Another neighbor remarked, this story didn't add up because Lauren and Graham loved their daughters so much. They absolutely adored the girls. They were so grateful because they struggled to get pregnant and when they finally got them, they loved them, she said. 
but the authorities were very firm in their belief that Lauren was responsible. They publicly stated that they were not pursuing any other suspects. So why did Lauren do what she did? There's not any information about how Lauren and Graham met, but I suspect it was through their mutual profession as doctors. And once they met, fell in love, and got married, it was time to try for children. This process was very difficult for them, and they struggled to get pregnant for quite some time. So when they got pregnant for the first time, about nine years into their marriage, you can imagine that it was such a beautiful and exciting moment. And then to get pregnant again with twins was truly a miracle. But Lauren and Graham wanted kids so badly, and their dreams were finally coming true. They loved their daughters so hard and so well. Unfortunately, one of the girls was born with a disfigured lip, which required surgery. According to a family friend, this caused a lot of stress for Lauren. And rightfully so, surgery on babies is super scary. And it's unclear if Lauren suffered from postpartum depression, but we'll talk about that a little later on. Now, Lauren and Graham originally lived in South Africa, but a few weeks before the incident, they relocated to New Zealand. The reason for the move was that Graham took a new job as an orthopedic surgeon at Timaru Hospital. And Lauren was a hospital doctor herself, but from what I gathered, she left her job in South Africa and didn't have one set up in New Zealand just yet. Okay, so before the move, Lauren shared a Facebook post that said, I am bent, but not broken. I am sad, but not hopeless. I'm tired, but not lifeless. I'm scared, but not powerless. I have wanted to give up, but did not. How do you get it right, many people ask. My answer remains the same, because the Lord gives me strength to stand up. And in another post Lauren shared about mental illness, she emphasized this sentence. Unfortunately, we live in a world where if you break a bone, everyone comes to sign the cast. But if you tell people you're depressed, they run the other way. However, the Dickinson's babysitter from South Africa mentioned that Lauren was super pumped about the move. Anyway, when the family first arrived in New Zealand, they stayed at a hotel for a mandatory two-week quarantine. So Lauren and Graham were cooped up in a hotel room with twin toddlers and a six-year-old in a new country on a new continent. That's a lot of change. On top of that, five people in a hotel room seems pretty tight, and kids that age can be overwhelming. So with no outside help, I'm sure Lauren and Graham were spent. During this period though, Lauren was posting on Facebook and seemed excited about their move. She asked her friends for school suggestions for her daughters and even furniture stores for their new home. But we all know everything isn't as it seems on social media. One of the hospital employees actually spoke to the media about how horrific the quarantine process is. The immigration process is extremely traumatic. I understand the place where the Dickinsons had to spend their quarantine was basically like a prison. You don't see anyone, your food is delivered to your door, and you're only let out for about an hour a day. To make matters worse, Lauren wasn't on her regular medication either. It's unclear what disorder or illness Lauren struggled with, but reports mention her taking chronic medication. Apparently medication like that can get in the way of the immigration process, which is why she stopped. So that's another factor that could lead Lauren to do the unthinkable. First of all, if she's struggling with a mental illness that requires medication, she most likely has a chemical imbalance in her brain. And if she's been taking medication regularly for years and all of a sudden cuts it off cold turkey, we're dealing with both withdrawals and messing with that brain imbalance. To me, that would explain the story everyone was telling about Lauren, that she was such a sweet, kind mother who would never hurt her kids. But if she was struggling with mental illness, withdrawals, and overall stress from the move and quarantine, that could explain things a bit better. Note how I said explain, not justify. I think what Lauren did is despicable to say the least. I'm just trying to theorize some answers for us all. After their two weeks in hotel jail were up, the Dickinsons moved into a place near the hospital. It was part of a housing program for doctors and medical professionals, so it seemed like a pretty sweet setup. One parenting journalist who commented on the case brought up a good point. 
She said the act of killing or wanting to kill our own children should never be excused or normalized. But what about the red flags paving the way to tragedy? The more we as mothers talk about our darkest and most shameful experiences, the more we see we're not alone and the better the chance at intervention before tragedy strikes. While legally unconfirmed, most people assume Lauren suffered a postpartum induced psychotic episode which led her to slay her children. I don't love using this word, but it's honestly the most comforting explanation. Nobody wants to hear that this woman offed her children just because they were on her nerves or that she was just a cruel person. And no matter the reason, we can't go back and change what happened. Here are the latest updates on this case. Lauren was stabilized at the hospital and subsequently sent to a mental health facility. She appeared in court to hear the charges made against her and she entered no plea. Until her next court date, Lauren will remain in police custody at a secure mental health unit. Graham has since moved back to South Africa and publicly forgave his wife in a letter he read at his daughter's vigil. Yeah, I was shocked to hear that too. He said, my faith in humanity has been restored. I thank you all. In this time of terrible tragedy and adversity, I can only ask for prayer for myself, my family, and my friends. Prayer for strength and for healing. For the people touched and affected by this. Look after yourselves. Look after your wives, after your husbands, your partners. Look after your children. Please also pray for my lovely Lauren, as I honestly believe that she's a victim of this tragedy as well. People that know her well will testify to that, I have no doubt. I've already forgiven her, and I urge you in your own time to do the same. He closed out the letter by saying, we have been blessed with love and support. My faith in humanity has been restored. I thank you all. Well, I'm glad Graham was able to find peace in light of the situation but I don't know if I would have faith in humanity after losing my three daughters like that. Obviously, everyone processes things differently, and I hope to never be in his shoes, but I'm honestly impressed by how he's handling everything. What do you think? Why do you think Lauren did what she did? Would you be able to forgive her like Graham? And if you hear of any updates about this ongoing case, please let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Brandy. See you next time on Killer Bites. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me. This is Killer Bites, the show where we cover some pretty wild true crime cases. Today I'm covering the topic of Rock Terrio and his cult, the Ant Hill Kids. Warning, this story involves many brutal descriptions of torture, so please be prepared to hear some not nice things. On May 16th, 1947, Rock Terrio was born in Saguenay, Quebec, Canada. Rock's family was enormous. He was the second oldest out of eight kids. Rock was described as an outgoing, intelligent kid. Despite this, he dropped out of school in seventh grade. Once Rock dropped out, he started to study the Old Testament in the Bible and became obsessed with the battle between good and evil. He was fully convinced that an apocalypse was on its way and the world was coming to an end. Rock thrived in large group settings and wanted to take charge whenever possible. He was outgoing and charming and people gravitated toward that energy. At 21, Rock married a 17-year-old girl named Francine and they had two children together. He supported them by selling wood carvings he created. Rock's health started taking a turn for the worse. He started complaining of extreme abdominal pain and was eventually diagnosed with stomach ulcers. Rock underwent multiple surgeries to fix his stomach issues, but the surgeries ended up causing him more pain. In addition to the ulcers, he dealt with rapid gastric emptying, which is better known as dumping syndrome. With all of his medical complications, Rock hated doctors and doubted the medical field. They were supposed to cure him and ultimately made his pain 10 times worse. After the multiple failed surgeries and debilitating pain, the only things that brought him any pain relief were substances and alcohol. His finances crumbled, he became angry and violent, and he cheated on Francine. They'd been married for seven years, but she decided enough was enough and the two divorced. Rock and the woman he cheated on Francine with, Giselle, 
ended up tying the knot. After this, things started to change for Rock. He started reading up on medical journals and went from drinking like a monster to having a very unhealthy lifestyle to preaching to everyone he knew about his medical discoveries and decided he wanted to make a lifestyle change. He stopped drinking and using substances, started eating healthy foods, and began caring for his overall health. While Rock made these changes in his life, he wanted to surround himself with others who felt similarly. He left Catholicism and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Their whole thing was living a healthy lifestyle and getting rid of tobacco and processed food. Rock really honed in on their holistic approach to everything. He was practically a rock star in the church, getting more and more people to come to services. Everyone was so pleased with Rock's enthusiasm that they let him give out sermons during services. The attention got to his head, and at one point, he told anyone who would listen that God had spoken to him through a vision. The end of the world was near, and Roe could use his powers and his newly appointed position of God's messenger to heal the sick. He told these stories to everyone, and somehow there were people who genuinely believed him despite never having witnessed it for themselves. However, others in the church were furious that Rock was spreading these lies and trying to gain leadership. So the other church leaders kicked him out, and rightfully so. This was not a deterrent for Rock, though. Through his time at Seventh-day Adventist, he had gained a little bit of a following as the self-identified people savior. He convinced people to leave their lives, quit their jobs, pull their kids out of school, and follow him to new heights. And to make matters worse, Rock prohibited any of his followers from contacting their loved ones in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Instead, he told them to listen to his sermons and motivational speeches. He was their new family. Only then would they be free of sin. So, Rock and 13 men and women traveled to the middle of nowhere, Eternal Mountain, to start a commune. He declared the end of the world was coming in February of 1979 because God had spoken to him and gave him that cute little tidbit of info. And the only way they could survive was if they remained in a remote location and built their commune from scratch. You know when you're working on a group project and one guy does nothing but boss everybody around? Yeah, that was Rock. While his followers were chopping down trees, building log cabins, and foraging for food, Rock sat back and observed. He made everyone wear the exact same clothes to promote equality and devotion to the group. He rationed their food and restricted nourishment if anyone ever complained. While sitting on his lazy ass, eating as much food as he wanted, and drinking alcohol, even though he preached that his followers were banned from consuming it, Rock looked at his followers and compared them to a colony of ants. And the Ant Hill kids were born. Rock decided to rename everyone in the commune to biblical names, starting with himself. He believed that he was the reincarnation of Moses and demanded that everyone treat him as such. And what do you do when you're an abusive misogynist? Well, you marry as many women as you want, of course. So Rock married and impregnated every single woman in the cult. He wanted to expand the group and keep the members devoted to him. And then, wouldn't you know it, February 1979 rolled around and the world didn't come to an end. The group started to raise their eyebrows at Rock. Maybe he didn't know as much as he said he did. This speculation was quickly squashed because Rock said God and Earth did not run at the same time. Most accepted the miscalculation and moved on, but some slowly realized that something was not right. By the 80s, the Ant Hill Kids had over 40 members. Rock had impregnated nine of his female followers and produced over 20 children. At this point, he had complete and utter control of the adults, and now he was the father to countless children. He continued abusing his power, but now it was on an even more heinous level. Members were not allowed to speak to one another unless in the presence of Rock. They also needed to ask his permission if they wanted to engage in intimate acts with one another. Rock would spy on the members, and if he caught them doing something he disapproved of, he'd explain that God had alerted him of their actions. If Rock thought there were doubters or followers who wanted to leave the commune, their punishment would be physical pain. Sadly, the children endured horrible physical, emotional, and sexual abuse from Rock as well. Despite all of the terror the members of the Ant Hill Kids were facing, Rock would occasionally be mentioned in the newspaper. Reports deemed him a gentle mountain man, but as we know, he was anything but. One man named Guy Veer saw these articles and decided he wanted to join the group. He traveled out into the wilderness, found the group, and was assigned babysitting duty. 
However, he could only care for the children who were not biologically rocks. In 1981, a two-year-old child named Samuel was Rock's next target. Samuel was having difficulty urinating, no doubt from the physical harm he had received at the commune, and Rock believed that he was a doctor and could cure him of the problem. He poured rubbing alcohol down Samuel's throat as an anesthetic and took a pair of scissors to the little boy's private area in a botched operation. Tragically, Samuel did not survive because his injuries were so severe. Rock forced his followers to burn the body to dispose of it. Rock, being the absolutely horrifying human he is, took no accountability for executing this young child. Apparently, Guy had suffered from headaches before the incident, and Rock convinced him that the best way to cure his headaches was, in fact, castration. Guy signed a consent form giving Rock permission to carry out another botched operation. Surprisingly, he survived, but he knew that he needed to escape. Immediately, Guy found the authorities and told them everything about Rook, the commune, and the murder of Samuel. The authorities traveled out to the commune where they found Samuel's charred body. Rock and eight other members who were responsible for the crime were arrested and thrown in prison. Social services were called out and they removed 17 children from the commune. Rock was charged with criminal negligence causing bodily harm, but only ended up serving 14 months in prison. Only 14 months! After his release, he was back and ready to continue his torture. Following the release of Rock and some of the other arrested members, the commune moved from Eternal Mountain to Burnt River, Ontario in 1984. He conducted gladiator tournaments where he forced members to strip down and climb into a dirt pit to fight for his pleasure. Once again, the commune sank into tragedy as there was yet another passing of a child. This time, it was one of Rock's biological children. However, he believed this child was from the devil. One of Rock's wives decided to leave it outside in a wheelbarrow in the middle of the winter to escape a life living with Rock. I mean, this is Canadian winter and the child froze to death. This death was immediately investigated by the authorities who already had Rock and his followers on their list. And in 1987, child services once again came to the commune and removed 14 children. There were only adults left in the commune, two men and eight women from this point on. After all the children had been removed, Rock became even more violent. He believed he was a doctor and continued with his surgeries on the people who were left. Giselle, Rock's second wife, attempted to flee the commune but was unsuccessful. Rock threw a hunting blade at her and created a wound so deep that the bleeding continued for hours. Rock grabbed a beer and went to sleep before waking up again and deciding he would operate on Giselle's leg. He pressed on her leg so hard that the wound reopened. In another instance, Rock beat one of his pregnant wives in the stomach repeatedly, so severely that she miscarried. It was only after the horrific torture of another member of the Ant Hill Kids, a woman named Gabrielle. She had tried to escape but was unsuccessful. Before her first attempt to flee, Rock forcibly removed eight of her teeth when she complained of a toothache. But in August of 1989, Gabrielle fled again. This time she hitchhiked all the way to a nearby hospital and called the police. Finally, after years of brutal torture, a warrant was put out for Rock's arrest. However, he caught wind of this and went on the run. It took the authorities over six weeks to track him down. Rock Terrio pleaded guilty to three counts of aggregated assault and one count of unlawfully causing bodily harm. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison, but don't fret because another cult member led the police to another body on the commune grounds, Solange. After this, Rock pleaded guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. In 2002, Rock tried to apply for parole, but he was rejected as he was too high a risk to reoffend. He never applied again. But wait, there's more. At 63 years old, Rock was found dead in his cell at Dorchester Penitentiary. <sighs> How are we feeling, everybody? I know that was a really rough one to get through. Unfortunately, some people are just so horrible and far gone that there's no way to skirt around their horrid crimes. Let me know what you all thought of this one in the comments, and I'll see you in the next one. In today's episode, we'll be talking about a very heartbreaking case involving a five-year-old girl named Mackenzie Mason. Please note that this case deals with child abuse, so if you'd prefer another case type, we have plenty of other episodes to check out. In general, it's said that parents are supposed to protect and care for their children, right? This is why it's so unfortunate to hear cases involving people doing the exact opposite, harming their children. 
Hillary and Andrew Mason both say their daughters Mackenzie and Michaela were just picky eaters. But when paramedics responded to a 911 call about one of the girls being unresponsive, it seemed like there was a larger, more concerning issue at hand. And just a few years later, something similar happened to the girl's cousin. What is the deal with the Masons? The first incident took place in May of 2015. A 25 year old woman named Hillary Mason called 911 saying her stepdaughter Mackenzie was refusing to eat, or as she put it, rebelling against food. And I know you're probably thinking that's an odd reason to call 911, but it didn't take long for Hillary to mention her real reason for calling. Mackenzie was unresponsive. Hillary claimed she was bathing Mackenzie and suddenly she became incoherent and stopped breathing. Hillary told the dispatcher that her husband, Andrew, 27, was doing CPR, but it wasn't working. Paramedics rushed to the Masons' home in Port Huron, Michigan. Mackenzie was still unresponsive, but they took her to the hospital where nurses and doctors attempted to revive her for over 45 minutes. Defeated and heartbroken, they had to call it. Mackenzie was pronounced lifeless. The first responders and medical professionals were shocked at how bad Mackenzie looked. She was severely malnourished and dehydrated, weighing in at 25 pounds at five years old. The average weight for a healthy five-year-old is 34 to 50 pounds. Mackenzie didn't look like a kid who just rebelled from food for a few days. She looked like a child who'd been deprived of food and water for a very long time. She also had several bruises on her body and a severe infection in her genital area. An autopsy was later performed where Mackenzie's COD was labeled as dehydration and malnutrition, complicated by pneumonia and its related conditions. The Masons had another little girl, Michaela, who was also in rough condition, but thankfully she was still alive. At age three, Michaela weighed 17 pounds, which is the average weight of an eight month old baby. Michaela apparently chugged four glasses of water when the police arrived, and she was so weak, she could barely bite into an apple. Because of her unhealthy state, Michaela was also brought to the hospital. A pediatrician who saw Michaela said she was so thin that you could see her ribs sticking out. In addition, her skin was extremely dry and her stomach was distended. The doctor diagnosed Michaela with failure to thrive, severe and chronic malnourishment, and neglect. She suspected Michaela had been malnourished for at least a year and a half, and this is also why her speech and motor skills were delayed. Michaela was immediately taken from Hillary and Andrew's care, along with two other kids, who reports say were Hillary's biological children. And interestingly enough, Hillary's kids didn't show signs of severe malnourishment, just Andrew's kids did. Hmm. Right off the bat, police made this statement. There is evidence of foul play present at the scene. We are treating this as a homicide investigation. And within days, Hillary and Andrew were charged with murder, torture, and child abuse. Andrew and Hillary both claimed they were innocent. Hillary asked for an attorney, Andrew did not. They both were denied bail. Hillary was quoted saying, I would like to fight with this. There is no truths in most of what was said. I've given the detectives everything, every detail of what happened that day. There was no intention on any of this. I have a hard time believing that. Whether you intentionally kept your kids from eating or not, the bottom line is they weren't eating. And anyone should know that not eating, especially in your developmental years, is dangerously unhealthy and leads to malnourishment. So let's get to the trial, which you can imagine was a tough one, given the matter at hand. It's one thing to harm an adult, but to hurt your own child, that's another level. Although Hillary and Andrew maintained their innocence throughout, there was a lot of evidence piling up against them. Mackenzie and Michaela's past doctors took the stand, saying the girls hadn't been brought in for a checkup for over a year. In Mackenzie's last visit, which was a year and a half before she passed, the doctors started to notice Mackenzie's stagnant weight. At this point though, she weighed 27 pounds. So over a year and a half, Mackenzie lost two pounds when she should have been gaining several. 
The doctor recommended Mackenzie be taken to a specialist just in case it, it wasn't a thyroid issue or anything. But of course, Hillary and Andrew never did that. The defense argued that Mackenzie and Michaela were super picky eaters and must have had an illness that caused their malnourishment. But that didn't seem to be true, as Michaela about doubled her weight in the six months after she was taken from Hillary and Andrew's home. Also, side note, a few months after the incident, Michaela literally broke both femurs because her bones were so weak from the malnutrition. Isn't that horrible? Michaela has since seen several specialists, including a gastroenterologist, geneticist, and endocrinologist. And no one believes she has any sort of underlying illness that would cause malnutrition. So this must have been caused by her parents, who were supposed to be feeding her regularly. The first person to take the stand for the defense was Michaela and Mackenzie's great-grandma, Sharon. She claimed Hillary was very loving to both girls and said Andrew acted normal with them too. Sharon said Michaela and Mackenzie were super picky eaters, especially Michaela. Then the prosecution questioned Sharon. Two weeks before the incident, Sharon went on a camping trip with the family. The defense showed her several photos from the trip of the girls looking very thin and asked, did you have a phone? Sharon replied, yes. When did you use it to get help for Michaela? The attorney replied. We didn't, Sharon said. Dang, that's so true. I didn't even think about all the people around the Mason family that could have spoken up. It might seem awkward for a friend or relative to have to report that, but at the end of the day, those girls were at danger, and if the parents weren't going to step in and do something, someone else should have. But Sharon didn't think it was her place to say anything. Or it seems more like she was trying to prevent Hillary and Andrew from going to jail. Sharon even tried to be all smart with the prosecutor, pointing out photos from the trip where Mackenzie was eating potato salad, cake, or a banana, as labeled in one of the reports. All of which aren't full meals or sustainable enough for a growing child. Hillary's father also spoke up in support of his daughter and son-in-law. He said the kids have been giving her problems with eating. Both of the little girls have. We've lost a wonderful, young, beautiful grandchild. I don't think this was an intentional starvation, whatever. It was not anything like that. My daughter is not malicious, nor is my son-in-law. Michaela and Mackenzie's biological mom, Shelby Coffey, had other opinions about her girls being in Hillary and Andrew's care. After losing custody of them in a legal battle with Andrew in 2013, Shelby believed her girls never had a chance. Unfortunately, Shelby couldn't give them a loving, nurturing home either as she was involved in a domestic disturbance and served jail time. She tried to visit them after losing custody but was never able to for various reasons. Sometimes she wasn't allowed. Other times, Hillary and Andrew would just say the kids weren't home. But Hillary and Andrew would always reassure Shelby that the kids were doing great. So when Shelby saw the photos of how terribly thin her daughters were, that had to be heartbreaking. Not to mention finding out one of them passed. Yeah, Shelby wasn't perfect, but no matter what, a mother losing their child has to be one of the hardest things in the world. The paramedics who first arrived at the Mason home after the 911 call was made also testified. They said Mackenzie had no sign of pulse or breath when they arrived. Mackenzie looked like she'd been lifeless for a while, despite Hillary's claim that it had only been a few minutes. And then Daniel Spitz, the medical examiner who performed Mackenzie's autopsy, said her temperature at the hospital was much too low for her to have just passed away. In response, Hillary's attorney, Michael, diverted the conversation by asking Daniel about all of the mistakes he's made in the past. But as much as Michael tried to prove Hillary's innocence, the court wasn't buying it. In January of 2016, both Andrew and Hillary were found guilty of the abuse and torture of both children and the demise of Mackenzie. Hillary bawled her eyes out as she was cuffed and sent away to await her sentencing. Mm, nope, I do not feel bad for Hillary one bit. In March, Andrew and Hillary had their sentencing hearing. Both parents were sentenced to jail for life without the possibility of parole, which was a relief for just about the whole courtroom. 
The judge told everyone this was the third case he's presided over where a kid has lost their life at the hands of their parents and or step parents. He said, what puzzles me is how in a community so dedicated to combating child abuse and neglect, these conditions go undetected until it is too late. Those who saw and chose to do nothing are, in my mind, equally responsible for this crime. They must share the blame. As for the three kids who were removed from Andrew and Hillary's care, most reports say Hillary's two biological children were sent to foster homes. Michaela was also sent to a foster home, but has since been reunited with her biological mom, Shelby. After passing psychological and psychiatric evals and taking a reunification course, counseling, and parenting classes, Shelby was able to regain custody of her daughter. Good for her. She's happy to share that Michaela is in much better health. She seems really happy, and her speech and motor skills have improved a lot too. But just as the loose ends were being tied in this case, there was another sudden death of a child in the Mason family. In February of 2018, first responders were sent out to a home in Port Huron for an unresponsive three-year-old child. It's unclear as to who made the 911 call and what was said because the county dispatch auto-deletes recorded calls after a year. Which seems a bit too early if you ask me. So many cases take years to solve, so why can't they just archive those calls somewhere? Anyway, here's what we know. Three-year-old Matthew Mason was found lifeless in his home. To give you context, Matthew's mom, Amanda, is Andrew's sister. So these kids were cousins. There's barely any information out there about Matthew's case because it is still ongoing. All we know is Matthew's death certificate wasn't filed until May. It said he was pronounced lifeless at 9 a.m. on February 19th, but the actual time of his passing is unknown, and the COD was labeled as pending investigation. Matthew's autopsy report still hasn't been released because it apparently hasn't been finalized still, and the case is ongoing. The assistant prosecutor was quoted saying, cases involving young children can be extremely difficult, sometimes taking years, as in this case. This leads most people, including me, to believe that this is another case involving abuse. Both Amanda and her boyfriend, Maurice, have given statements to the police, and from what I can tell, neither of them have been arrested or anything. Although there are rumors out there about people having possibly called CPS on the family. But a spokesman for Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services said in an email, by law, I can't discuss specifics of a children's protective services case, including whether or not there were reports made to CPS about a specific family. It's been over four years and no one knows why or how Matthew passed away, which is absolutely tragic. Reporters have tried contacting great grandma Sharon, remember her, but she declined to comment. And we all know Sharon will do whatever she can to protect her children. So I don't think we'll hear a peep from her. I hope investigators find the answers for this case soon so justice can be brought to Matthew's name. I just find it strange that something so horrific happened twice to one family. And I wonder why there are so many cases like these in this area of Michigan. Apparently in 2014, there were at least 527 cases involving kids being harmed in St. Clair County. That's absolutely horrific. In fact, a few months after Mackenzie's case, one mom in the same county gave her 16-month-old son too much Benadryl, causing him to pass away. She was found guilty of second-degree murder and child abuse. There are also several other cases that happened in that area that I just don't have the emotional bandwidth to talk about today. On that note, please be kind in the comments and let me know what case you'd like me to cover next. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If any of you are fans of reality television, especially the real Housewives of Beverly Hills, there's a good chance you've heard about the drama surrounding Erica Jane and her husband, Thomas Girardi. Erica Jane was born to her mother, Renee, on July 10th, 1971. Renee was just 18 years old when she had Erica and was thrust into the world of young motherhood. 
Unfortunately, her baby daddy abandoned them before Erica's first birthday, so a lot of responsibility fell on Renee. She lived with her parents, who were a great help in raising her child. She had always dreamed of working in entertainment. She took dance classes and got involved in musical theater to make that dream a reality. Erica graduated from North Atlanta High School, and shortly after turning 18, she moved to New York City. To support herself, Erica worked at a go-go club called Shakers in New Jersey. Then she started getting small modeling and acting gigs around the city, pushing her closer to her dream of being a star. She was asked to fill in for a member of a girl group called The Flirts and even recorded a few songs with them. Through the nightlife and music scene, Erica met a man named Thomas Zizzo, a DJ at a nightclub. The two hit it off immediately and were married in December of 1991. Three years later, the couple had their first son, whom they named Thomas Zizzo Jr. A couple more years have passed, and Erica's manager encouraged her to leave New York and move to Los Angeles. The industry was booming with acting and singing work, while New York was not producing as many opportunities. Erica felt like this was the right move and left her husband, taking their child and moving across the country to sunny Los Angeles, California. Erica worked as a waitress at a nice restaurant to cover her expenses. This place had tons of wealthy, important industry moguls coming in on a daily basis. The owner of this establishment? None other than Thomas Girardi. Thomas Girardi was born in Denver, Colorado on June 3, 1939. Thomas moved to Los Angeles and was very fortunate to attend schools of excellent caliber. He graduated from Loyola High School in Los Angeles and then Loyola Marymount University where he received his undergraduate degree. After this, he studied at Loyola Law School and received a JD degree in law. Once he graduated, Thomas and his friend Robert Keese started a law firm together called Girardi and Keese. Together, their law firm would take on some of the most crucial cases in America. For example, the case that inspired the movie Aaron Brockovich with Julia Roberts. In this case, a utility company called Pacific Gas and Electric agreed to pay out $460 million to 605 residents in Hinckley, California. Hinkley was a small desert community that went after this company for contaminating their water source, causing disease and cancer. Funny enough, Thomas was also an advisor for the movie's filming. With her bursts of success, Erica wanted to keep going. She hired Madonna songwriters, costumers who worked with big names like Lady Gaga, and dipped into Thomas's bank account whenever she could. In 2015, Erica Jane was asked to join the cast of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Fans of previous seasons of the show were immediately drawn to Erica. Her personality, quick wit, fun and lavish wardrobe, and the glam squad were something that people loved. With this new fan base, Erica's music career could go even further. Erica was asked to be on Dancing with the Stars and even book some acting gigs in movies and prominent television shows through her growing stardom. People in Thomas's professional life were worried. Thomas took on some pretty intense legal cases, fighting for the people and against evil corporations. These cases fueled Erica Jane's career. It was not a great look when you see Erica flaunting her exorbitant amount of wealth on television for millions of people. It was just in bad taste and made people question Thomas's legitimacy. One of Thomas's clients was a man named Joe Rua Gomez. Joe had one of the scariest tragedies I can think of. He and his wife were sitting in their living room, enjoying each other's company and watching a football game. Suddenly, the ground began to shake, and it wasn't because of an earthquake. In mere seconds, a gigantic explosion went off, cutting through multiple homes in the neighborhood. Somehow, Joe survived this incident, but was in terrible condition. Most of his body was covered in burns, and his lungs were severely damaged. He needed medical attention, and would need it for the rest of his life. How did this happen? Well, Pacific Gas and Electric was the company to blame. One of their pipes had burst, causing a leak and multiple homes and lives to be lost. 
Thomas had fought against them years before and won, so Joe's family knew that he was the right lawyer for them. At the start of their case, Thomas was incredibly compassionate for the family and their situation. It was common for Thomas to take the family out for dinners and bring them gifts. Thomas reassured the family that the case was a done deal and they were 100% going to win. Thomas and the law firm took their percentage of the winning amount and put the rest of the funds into a trust. That way the money was safe and ready for the family to use however and whenever they needed. Thomas decided to tell the family that he could double their money essentially. He could take their funds from the settlement, invest it, and would guarantee that they would have even more once he was done. Joe's family believed Thomas, so they allowed Thomas to take their money and invest it. Sadly, this investment was never paid out to the family. Joe was still in serious condition and had surgeries coming up. They needed the money to cover medical costs, but Thomas had taken everything. They reached out multiple times, practically begging for the money, and Thomas assured them they would get their money. A few payments were giving out to the family, but they were supposed to be coming in on the regular. However, after 2017, none of the payments were sent through, and they stopped altogether. Obviously, something was very, very wrong, and Thomas refused to be honest about his part in this. After patiently waiting for far too long, they hired another lawyer and filed a lawsuit against Thomas Girardi. Thomas agreed to pay the family $1 million a month for 12 months, which sounded like a great deal to them. However, after only one payment, Thomas stopped sending money. A deposition was held where Thomas Girardi admitted that his money was gone. Over $50 million had disappeared, and he had a few thousand left to his name. Sadly, Joe and his family were not the only people who had been scammed by Thomas. There were multiple other families from similar situations, all affected by his lack of honesty and theft. If all of this sounds bad, just remember that this happened while Erica was filming The Real Housewives show. The tabloids are coming out with crazy headlines trying to put the blame onto Erica and Thomas. But could she have known more than she was letting on? Did she know what Thomas was doing with his client's money? This stolen money was used to fund their lavish, extravagant, bougie lifestyle. In November of 2020, Erica Jane announced that she and Thomas had filed for divorce. Everyone on the show was shocked because they thought their marriage was super solid. However, there was clearly a lot going on behind the scenes. Just one month after the announcement, both Erica and Thomas were named in a lawsuit. Well, a Chicago judge froze Thomas's accounts and claimed that both he and Erica were responsible for embezzling money. What for? Well, Lion Flight 160 was a plane scheduled to land in Indonesia. However, sadly, the aircraft crashed, and clearly many families were affected due to this. Thomas was supposed to be the lawyer helping these people out. Anytime a family member contacted Thomas asking for the whereabouts of their money, he would make an excuse and cover it up. Instead, he took over $2 million, which belonged to the families of those who lost their lives. This money was used to fund Erica's music career and her expensive lifestyle. On top of that, Erica had been subpoenaed various times to track assets, but failed to show up each time. Finally, Erica resorted to selling her designer goods online to create enough money to cover the $2 million missing dollars. A law firm in Chicago ordered her to stop. There were two separate bankruptcy hearings for Girardi and Keese. However, neither Girardi nor Keese showed up. In 2021, the Los Angeles Times reported that Thomas had been sued upwards of 100 times and had numerous complaints against him by the California State Bar. Keese was still on excellent terms with multiple officials for the bar and used his influence to help his friend. But in March of 2021, Thomas Girardi's legal license was finally suspended and he was no longer allowed to practice law. In 2022, over 600 claims have been made against Girardi and Keys. In February of 2021, Thomas Girardi was placed under a conservatorship program due to his short-term memory loss. 
The following month, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, proving the need for a conservatorship program. A few months later, in August of 2021, Thomas was placed into a memory care facility where he is now. Sadly, many of the people Thomas helped are still waiting for financial compensation. I would love to hear your thoughts and theories in the comment section. Thanks for watching Killer Bites. I'm Brandy. See you next time. On January 31st, 1939, in Webster, South Dakota, Jerome, or Jerry, Brudos was born. Right from the jump, Jerry's mother, Eileen, made it abundantly clear that she did not want to have another boy. His mom was very verbally and physically abusive towards him. She took most of her resentment and frustrations out on him. The Brudos family moved around quite a bit, and home life was pretty unstable. Jerry didn't want to stay at home with his mother, who hated him, so he would play by himself outside and wander around. One time, Jerry was walking around and stumbled across a junkyard. In this junkyard, he found something fascinating to him, a pair of high heels, open-toed stilettos to be exact. So Jerry took the shoes back home with him. He wore them around the house, in his room, just really feeling the fantasy. Unfortunately, Jerry's mother found him while he was trying them on. She was horrified. She went on a tirade grabbed the shoes and threw them away. Jerry still wanted the shoes, so he grabbed them from the trash and hid them in his room to play alone. Once again, Eileen found Jerry with the heels, and this time she was enraged. She took the shoes and lit them on fire. When Jerry was in first grade, his family packed up and moved to California. Jerry's new teacher always wore high heels and kept an extra pair in the classroom. This was incredibly tempting to Jerry, who attempted to steal the extra pair of shoes. One of Jerry's classmates saw him going for the heels and called him out. Jerry admitted to his attempted theft, and the teacher got super mad at him. She embarrassed him in front of the entire class, and he left the room. The Brudos' new neighbors had several teenage daughters. Jerry would often sneak over with their little brother and look through their drawers and closets. This is where he developed a new fascination for women's underwear on top of high heels. Jerry went through puberty and started to develop curiosity about his body and bodies that were not like his own. This should not be a shameful time. However, Jerry's mom made it one. She forced him to hand wash his bed sheets when there were stains, almost demonizing him for growing up and having sexual desires. However, Jerry's urges became very scary and would soon turn violent. Jerry began stalking his female neighbors and would look through their windows. He would go through their laundry hanging up on a clothesline and steal their underwear. This happened multiple times, and it got so bad that the police were called to investigate the situation. Jerry caught wind that the cops were trying to find the thief and used this to his advantage. He showed up at the house, imitating a police officer, and asked the girl more questions about the underwear theft. He asked for her to come over to his house so he could ask questions there. She complied and said she would be right over. The girl arrived at Jerry's house and was immediately accosted. A guy wearing a mask held a blade up to the girl's throat, forcing her to take off her clothes and pose for nude pictures. So once he was done, he fled the scene. When Jerry was 17, he asked a girl to go on a drive with him, and she accepted the invite. So Jerry drove this girl to basically the middle of nowhere, close to a farmhouse. He had his blade and threatened the girl that he would hurt her if she didn't remove her clothes. Jerry chased after her and they got into a little tussle. While well, a couple driving nearby saw all of the commotion, pulled over and called the police. They searched his vehicle and found women's underwear and scandalous photographs. Jerry was arrested and charged with assault and battery. Jerry was very honest with the thoughts and fantasies he had. For example, he fantasized about capturing a girl, forcing her to do whatever he wanted, and watching her beg to be let go. Many of his fantasies revolved around the hatred of his mother, Eileen, and wanting power over women. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and got released after nine months because the doctors considered him no longer a danger to society. He didn't know what his next steps were, so he enlisted in the army at age 20. 
While in the army, Jerry was referred to an army psychiatrist who discharged him because of his weird obsessions. Once he was released, he was forced to move back in with his parents and live in their back shed. The creepy shenanigans started up again, and this time Jerry would become increasingly more violent with his victims. So Jerry was driving around in his car when he spotted a young woman walking home, who he decided to follow. When he saw the coast was clear, he jumped behind her and choked her until she passed out. Then he stole her shoes and made a run for it. The woman reported the incident, but she didn't see his face, so there wasn't much the police could do. Jerry got a job as an electronics technician and worked at a radio station. While there, he met a 17-year-old named Darcy Metzler, and the two started dating. After that, they moved around a lot, as it was difficult for Jerry to keep a job, and Darcy became pregnant. She gave birth to a daughter, and later on, a son. Back at home, things were super weird. Jerry made the basement his dark room to process the creepy photographs he had taken of women and their undergarments. He also wanted Darcy to dress up in the stolen garments and pose naked for photographs. She was not into this, which really upset Jerry. He felt like his wife didn't want to participate in his fantasies, so he needed to fulfill that desire another way. In 1968, his murderous streak would begin. On January 26, 1968, there was a knock at Jerry's front door. Linda Slauson, a 19-year-old girl, was going door-to-door -door selling encyclopedias. Linda followed him down into the basement where, unfortunately, Jerry took a piece of wood, knocked her over the head, and strangled her to death once she was down. This was Jerry's first murder victim. Jerry proceeded to dress Linda up in all the different items he had stolen. He put her in various undergarments and high heels and posed her body for pictures. After doing this, he cut off her left foot as a trophy and placed it in a high heel. He then stored it inside a freezer to preserve it. Jerry managed to sneak the body into his car. He drove to the Willamette River, pretended he had a flat tire, and used that as an excuse to pull over and dump the body. Jerry would not lure another victim to their death until November that same year. Within that time frame, Jerry and his family packed up and moved to Salem. On November 26, 1968, Jerry saw 23-year-old Jan Susan Whitney on the side of the road. Her car had broken down between Salem and Albany. Jerry pulled over and offered help, even offering to give her a ride back to his house to call a tow truck. Jan accepted the offer because she had no other option. They arrived at his home and Jerry proceeded to strangle Jan in the car. Once she was lifeless, he took her body into a secret garage hideout and hung it from a pulley. He dressed her in the stolen underwear and shoes, violated her body and took photographs. After this, he removed one of her breasts, made a mold of it, and painted it gold. Three months later, on March 27, 1969, Jerry found his third victim. A 19-year-old college student named Karen Sprinkler was walking to her car parked outside of a department store. Jerry, dressed in drag, approached Karen from behind and threw her into his vehicle. He restrained her and drove back to his garage. Once inside, he forced her into underwear and took photos of her. He repeatedly assaulted her and tragically strangled her with a pulley until she passed away. Multiple attempted kidnappings during this time were unsuccessful. For example, Jerry tried to abduct a 14-year-old girl named Leanne Brumley, but she escaped. In April of 1969, back-to-back -back kidnappings failed. One, Sharon Wood, a 24-year-old, fled after Jerry approached her with a gun in a parking garage. The next day, Jerry attempted to abduct a 15-year-old girl named Gloria Smith, but thankfully, she also got away. April 23, 1969, Jerry pretended to be a police officer outside a shopping mall. He approached Linda Sally, a 22-year-old, and said she she needed to come with him to the station. She complied because she believed he was who he said he was, and sadly, Jerry would take Linda's life. He violated her body, strangled her, and even electrocuted her. 
Then, after he was done playing his disgusting game, he tied a car transmission to her body with a nylon cord and threw her body into the river. In May of 1969, a fisherman discovered Linda's body in the Long Tom River. Two days later, Karen's body was found just 50 feet away. The police knew they had a serial killer on their hands. Based on the ages of these women, the police started patrolling the nearby college campus. Hundreds of women were questioned by police about a strange man targeting young women. Finally, after tons of interviews, they got a name and description. Jerry Brudos. So the cops start looking through Jerry's file. They saw that Jerry had been arrested on assault charges before. They also found that Jerry was an electrician, which stood out to them. The cord used to tie these women up was all the same kind used by electricians, and one of the bodies had markings attached to electrocution. The police searched Jerry's place and found a myriad of disturbing things. For one, all the photographs of these disturbing crimes, women's shoes and underwear, the wires and tools used to tie his victims. The police were on their way to his house with an arrest warrant, and this guy tried to flee. The authorities caught him and threw him in jail. While there, he tried to convince his wife to burn any evidence, to which she said, absolutely not. Once Jerry was arrested, he came clean on every single homicide and attempted homicide. He was deemed not criminally insane and diagnosed with antisocial personality, manifested by fetishism, transvestitism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, and especially sadism. The judge sentenced Jerry to three consecutive life sentences in Oregon State Penitentiary, and one month after his conviction, Jan Whitney's body was found. Jerry kept tons of women's shoe magazines in his prison cell, as that was his form of sexual entertainment, not regular adult magazines. While he tried to appeal, he was denied and told he would never, ever be released. On March 28, 2006, Jerry died in prison from liver cancer. This one is really intense, but let's get into it. We're gonna talk about a young man who took his fascination with serial killers and true crime stories way too seriously. Someone who went on to commit a truly heinous crime inspired by some of the all-time worst criminals such as Ted Bundy and the Yorkshire Ripper. Young James Fairweather was an average student attending Colchester Academy. He was a happy kid and had good attendance in school. In 2012, as James was starting to get older and about to approach his teenage years, a shift began, and it only escalated with the sudden passing of his grandmother, who he loved dearly. His report cards started to look different. His teachers reported that James was turning into a thug and that his personality had changed. His classmates began to see James as someone who dressed weird and acted weird and was an all-around outsider. Those classmates began to bully James. They would call him names like Dumbo. They would make fun of him for having big ears. In turn, James became more aggressive towards everyone. At one point during the school year, a group of his classmates mugged James and pulled out a blade on him. In his junior year, James told people at school that he had plans to decimate some of his fellow classmates. Some students did not return to school the next day after the claim had been made, but it didn't scare all of the students, so a lot of them did come back. He became fascinated with going on the computer and Google searching and studying true crime and homicide. He enjoyed watching videos of sexual assault victims and some really disturbing pornography. He studied, admired, and became obsessed in particular with Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. And of course, Ted Bundy, another one of his favorites. He was infatuated with them. Now, I love true crime cases too, but James Fairweather's love of true crime was not normal. It was very unhealthy. He used these cases and his idols as some sort of a user guide, a how-to guide for revenge and assassination. It started back in 2014 when Fairweather took a blade from the kitchen of his parents' home in Colchester. He slinked out of the house and made his way down to a local neighborhood shop. Using his blade as a weapon, he robbed the shop. He took cigars, cash, and some other random sh 
But James got caught for his crime. He was sentenced to 12 months of youth supervision. But right after he received this sentence, on March 29th, 2014, Fairweather snuck out of the second story window of his parents' house and went on prowl looking for someone or something to destroy. He walked around his neighborhood for a bit, but was unsuccessful in finding a victim. So he broadened his search and went walking through Castle Park. That's when he stumbled upon James Atfield, a drunk man who is fast asleep on the walkway of this beautiful park. James was hanging out at his local pub earlier and had one or five too many. He started his adventure home when he thought it'd be best to take a nap in the park and sleep off some of the buzz. Fairweather had found an easy target, a totally innocent person who couldn't defend themselves because they were asleep. Fairweather took his blade and punctured the man in the abdomen. Atfield woke up from the attack and tried to defend himself the best he could. Fairweather then had to become more aggressive and accomplish his task. James recalls the attack saying he screamed loudly, the sort of scream that goes right through you. James punctured the man in the torso many times. More than 100 puncture wounds were discovered on James Atfield's body. Fairweather also jabbed Atfield through the eye. And I hate to say this, but these cuts were not careless or chaotic or wild, but actually showed that Fairweather had a technique, similar to the technique of the monsters Fairweather admired, such as the Yorkshire Ripper. James has said that during the attack on James Atfield, quote, my voices were laughing and laughing louder and louder. Fairweather told police both murder weapons had been thrown in a river. It wasn't until hours later that James Atfield's body was found. It was around 5.45 a.m. that a nearby walker uncovered the horrific scene and called the authorities. Unfortunately, by the time the authorities showed up, James Atfield had passed. The officer who responded to the call recounts the scene. I saw something lying on the ground. I sprinted towards the object on the floor, which was clearly a body covered in blood. The body was lying face up. At this point, I donned my blue gloves. He said, I quickly checked on the state of the body, which had a large amount of wounds and a huge amount of blood underneath him. There were lacerations to his head, hands, and face, and a huge amount of blood congealed around his left eye. I couldn't see the eye at all. Fairweather was nowhere in sight. After Fairweather put an end to James Atfield's life, he went back home. He took off his clothes that were drenched in Atfield's body fluid, and he threw the soiled clothes into a trash bag and disposed of the evidence in a trash bin that was designated for dog poop. Fast forward to three months later, June 17, 2014, Fairweather struck again. This time, he didn't wait for nighttime. This time, he pounced on his target in broad daylight. He's getting bolder with his pursuit, cocky even. This time, his victim was 31-year-old Nahid Almanea. Nahid was from Saudi Arabia, but moved to the United Kingdom just six months prior to study the English language program at the International Academy. Nahid was a great student, very smart and well-liked by her other classmates, as well as by her teachers, the complete opposite of James Fairweather. Not that James knew any of this. Nahid was just a random target. He had no connection to her. The encounter between Nahid Almanea and James Fairweather on June 17, 2014, took place at the Salary Brook Trails off of Avon Way. This is the path that Nahid would take to and from her classes on campus. She walked that trail almost every day. She usually would walk this path with her brother, but unfortunately on that day, Nahid was alone. Fairweather was lurking around in the bushes. Nahid was solo, casually walking the trails. Then Fairweather snuck up behind her and hit her. She stumbled to the ground. Fairweather then used a weapon to slash Nahid 16 times. She passed instantly. Once he was done with Nahid, he chucked his weapon into the nearby river, disposing of the evidence. James once again took off his dirty clothes, dripping in red, and put them into the trash. James Atfield and Nahid Almanea's bodies were found only two miles apart, and the crimes took place just a couple of months apart. But even with this information, the police had nothing to connect these two crimes. At first, they thought they were unrelated crimes. No leads came in, and there were no real people of interest at the time. 
a £10,000 reward for anyone coming forward with information about the person who committed these crimes was offered, but no one ever came forward with tips or clues. There were multiple composite sketches of who the authorities might be looking for that were released to the public, but none of them actually looked anything like our guy James Fairweather. Fairweather seemed to have gotten away with both of these heinous crimes until May 26th, 2015, a whole year later. It was around 11 a.m. that Fairweather was back on Salary Brook trails and in search of another victim. He was back in the bushes, just a few feet away from where Nahid had passed. A woman walking the trail noticed Fairweather and had a gut reaction. She saw him, stopped her route, turned around, and started walking back in the direction she just came from because she was picking up on his vibe. She made a call to the police stating that there was a strange young man stalking around in the bushes and acting suspicious. She also found it odd that he was walking in the dog section of the park, but he didn't have a dog with him. She recounts that day at the park saying, he was no more than 15 feet away and staring straight at me. It's a face that will never leave me, a manic look. Back to the story. Police arrived on the scene to find 16-year-old James Fairweather trying to flee, but they stopped him. He said he was just out for a walk to clear his head and that he didn't feel right. The police asked him to take his hands out of his pockets and he complied, revealing he was wearing rubber gloves and carrying a lock knife. He was then taken into custody. That evening, he confessed to both crimes. He said he had found James Atfield asleep the night the voices in his head were telling him he needed to make the sacrifice and execute James, and that James was the chosen one. The voices said if Fairweather didn't go through with these actions, the voices would come after Fairweather himself. He said the voices were laughing at him louder and louder. He told them that Nahid had brought this act upon herself since she was walking the trails alone. Fairweather was on a roll. He even admitted to police that he was on the hunt for his next victim when they found him over at Salary Brook Trails. And for the cherry on top, he added that if he was jailed and was able to make bail and let out, he would again take the lives of innocent people. However, in January 2016, he retracted his statement. He denied having anything to do with Nahid or James. He denied being in possession of an offensive weapon, but admitted to two alternative counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. The Crown Prosecution Service did not want to take the plea deal. They decided to move forward and pursue the charges. Fairweather was now facing a double homicide trial. The trial took place in April of 2016. Fairweather continued his story of hearing voices in his head telling him to do it and make the sacrifice. He told those evaluating and questioning him that he was possessed by the devil. The courts, however, rejected this notion. It was revealed at the trial that he was diagnosed with Asperger's and autism, and that he had started hearing voices in his head as early as age 11. Dr. Joseph was brought into the trial as a prosecution witness. Dr. Joseph agreed with the Asperger's and autism diagnosis, but he called BS on Fairweather's supposed visual and auditory hallucinations. He said they were totally fabricated. And Dr. Joseph said that James was just making it up in an attempt to deceive the authorities. He was using the hallucinations to distance himself from the reality of what he had done. We know that Fairweather was obsessed and studied all those horrible criminals, and his internet search history can prove that. Talk to any of his teachers. Talk to any of his schoolmates. It was brought to the attention of the court that Fairweather revealed to the doctors evaluating him for this case that he had intentions of executing at least 15 more people, but didn't because he got caught. So this feels like a no-brainer. James Fairweather needs to go to jail. The jury for this case took eight plus hours to reach a final decision, but eventually they found him guilty of both murders. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison without the possibility of parole. And in true James Fairweather fashion, he reacted to the verdict by giving a thumbs up, and then he looked over to his parents and mouthed the words, I don't give a Talk about no remorse for your actions. So disrespectful. What do you guys think? Is James Fairweather the worst criminal we've ever covered? 
Do you believe he was hearing voices in his head leading him to commit these vicious acts? Was it really his grandmother's death that sent him over the edge or was he just a ticking time bomb? I wanna hear all about it, so please let us know in the comments below. I'm Brandy, this has been Killer Bites. Stay safe out there and be wary of people at dog parks that are there without a dog. See ya. What's up, Killer Bites fam? I hope you're ready for some true crime. If this is your first time here, welcome to Killer Bites, a web series where we dish on all sorts of mind-blowing true crime cases. Now, in today's episode, I'll be going over everything we know about the disappearance of Fawn Maria Mountain. When Fawn disappeared in 2012 without a trace, her girlfriend, Heather, didn't go looking for her. Instead, she immediately remodeled their trailer home, moved out of state, and started dating another woman. So it seems like the girlfriend is clearly responsible, right? Well, Fawn filed a restraining order against her mom shortly before disappearing, which makes things more confusing. Maybe it was just the mom. Stick around to find out. 25-year-old Fawn Maria Mountain was last seen in November of 2012. At the time, she was in a relationship with a woman named Heather. Together, they lived in a trailer in Claysburg, Pennsylvania. Heather's brother, Mike, lived in the same trailer park with his girlfriend, Stephanie. So they were pretty close relationship-wise and distance-wise. On November 25th, both couples went over to Heather and Mike's parents' house. There, they helped Heather's parents clean up their butcher shop and prepare for the upcoming hunting season. When they finished their chores, Fawn, Heather, Mike, and Stephanie had a few drinks before heading back to their trailer park together. They stopped at Mike's trailer first so Heather could help Mike unload something from his car and bring it inside. While that was going on, Fawn and Stephanie stayed in the car and made small talk. That's when Fawn told Stephanie she planned to go home watch a scary movie and chill out before going to bed. Right after that, Heather and Mike came back, the two couples parted ways, and they went about their evenings. The following morning, Heather's parents came by to pick her and Mike up as they both worked at the butcher shop. When the parents pulled up to Heather's trailer, they noticed Heather outside smoking with no fawn in sight. Stephanie asked Heather where fawn was, and she said she had run away in the middle of the night. Uh, and you're just out there just casually smoking a cigarette like that? I'd be panicking. Heather claimed she got up to go to the bathroom around 3 a.m. and Fawn wasn't there. She said she tried looking for Fawn but had no luck. This wasn't the first time that Fawn had run away, however, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. So Heather went about her day as the suspicions grew, specifically Stephanie's suspicions. Heather normally freaked out about Fawn running away, but she didn't this time. Fawn didn't take anything from their trailer before allegedly running away. She didn't grab a jacket, and it was in November in New Pennsylvania. Heather didn't reach out to any of Fawn's family or friends to let them know she ran away or ask them if she knew about her whereabouts. And over the next few weeks, she had made some drastic life decisions. Things like remodeling her and Fawn's trailer home, moving to Ohio and dating a new woman. All this stuff happened way too fast, according to popular opinion. Stephanie was the one who eventually called Fawn's mom, Dorothy, because she had a feeling something had happened based on all these weird factors. Dorothy tried to report her daughter as missing, but the police, of course, took Heather's word as the Bible and just assumed that Fawn ran away and was totally okay. So let's travel back in time to learn more about Fawn's life until this point and see if there are any clues that might lead to more information about her disappearance. Fawn grew up in a very broken home. Her parents were always fighting, and she was physically violated at a young age by several people in her life. Despite all of this, Fawn tried to remain positive, outgoing, adventurous, cheerful, friendly, and kind were the words most people use to describe Fawn. But Fawn struggled in relationships. Since Fawn was abused by men growing up, it was all she knew. She also had serious trust issues for understandable reasons. When she started dating the guys she often went out with were scumbags who treated her like shit. One of the abusive guys Fawn was with got her pregnant twice. She gave birth to both babies but lost custody of them because she struggled with getting a job and functioning as an adult who needed to be responsible for two babies. Her baby daddy really messed her up, both physically and mentally. Fawn lost all self-worth and it was at her lowest of lows. So she fell back into this awful cycle of dating terrible men. Fawn got pregnant for a third time with a baby girl named Kaden. Unfortunately, Kaden was stillborn, which crushed Fawn, uh, leaving her more broken and more traumatized than before. So here's where we get to Fawn and Heather. They met in 2009 at a local bar. Now up until that point, Fawn had only dated men, but after meeting Heather, she decided to give women a try romantically. 
She spent every waking minute with Heather and moved in with her pretty quickly. When Fawn told her mom she wanted to move in with Heather, she told her she'd never move back to their hometown of Altoona. Dorothy thought this was an odd thing to say, especially since Altoona was just a 20 mile drive from where she was moving with Heather. Friends and family mentioned Fawn acting strange after moving with Heather, and Heather changed a lot in regards to the way that she treated Fawn. Over time, Heather became very possessive of Fawn. Heather took Fawn everywhere she went, even if it meant leaving her locked in the car while she was at work. Fawn wasn't allowed to hang out with friends, get a job, or have a cell phone, but Heather manipulated Fawn into thinking all of this was for her safety and well-being, which Fawn convinced herself into believing. She loved Heather, and trusted that she truly had her best interests at heart. And then the physical abuse started. Fawn went to the hospital several times for injuries, which definitely raised eyebrows. But as soon as social workers and nurses started asking questions about Fawn potentially being harmed at home, Heather would switch up the hospital they went to when Fawn was hurt. There became a point when Fawn started to realize how horrible Heather was to her. Fawn tried to run away several times, but Heather would always find her and force her home. In 2011, Fawn filed a restraining order against her mom, Dorothy, just out of nowhere. Dorothy was in shock. She didn't have the greatest relationship with her daughter in the beginning, but they'd recently been doing well. So why would Fawn file for a restraining order all of a sudden? But it wasn't Fawn who filed for the order, it was Heather. Oh my God, this girl is insane. Speaking of restraining orders and Heather being insane, Stephanie said a few of Heather's past partners got restraining orders against her because she was so abusive. So the court decided Heather was clearly a danger to these people, which meant she could definitely be and was a danger to Fawn. Heather continued to seclude Fawn from the outside world and Dorothy was really the only other person in Fawn's life aside from Heather. So with the new order in place, there was really nothing going for Fawn. She wasn't able to see her mom, didn't have friends, a job, or any activities that brought her joy other than her conversations with Stephanie through the window. But it wasn't long until Heather caught wind of Fawn and Stephanie's window chats and boarded up the windows. Isn't that crazy? Like, after this, Fawn tried to run away several more times. Each time, Heather found her and forced her back home. In November 2012, Fawn ran away to her mom's house. Heather quickly found her and called the police on Dorothy for breaking the restraining order. Dorothy was sent to jail for two days because of this. Wow. At this point, Dorothy was extremely concerned for her daughter's well-being, but she really couldn't do anything because of this restraining order. So she asked the police to do welfare checks on Fawn every once in a while. They performed these until November, the month she vanished. Fawn wasn't officially reported missing until 2015. That's three years later. Fawn's relatives kept trying to contact her and they tried to see her in person, but it was clear she wasn't there. They had no idea she had been missing for three years. Fawn's family did some sleuthing and learned Fawn was still receiving welfare checks to Heather's trailer. They decided to call the social security office to make a report. The social security office sent out a letter to Fawn about a mandatory appointment that she failed to appear at. And that's what it took for the police to finally take Fawn's disappearance seriously. Well, actually they didn't even take it seriously. They just filed a missing persons report. And after that, they didn't follow up with anyone, conduct any searches, or really put any effort into looking for Fawn. So Fawn and her cousin Bridget fell out of touch as they grew up, and Bridget didn't find out about the disappearance until 2017. Bridget knew she had to do something to help find her cousin. She reached out to Stephanie to get more information and started bugging the police about the case. Bridget and Stephanie became driving forces in this case, helping spread the word and trying to piece everything together. The woman reached out to people in Fawn's life to ask some questions. Everyone said they couldn't remember specifics, but said something along the lines of, I did a thorough interview with the police a few years ago. They should know. So Bridget and Stephanie reached out to the police to see if they could get their interviews. But the police said they lost the recordings. The person in charge of the case was fired because of this, but no one had been assigned to Fawn's case after that. Seems hella lazy and completely disrespectful to Fawn's situation. In August, Bridget finally got the state involved with a new investigation of the case. It seemed like the authorities finally had their act together and were ready to get down to the bottom of this case. Five years too late. A reward was posted. Heather was evicted from the trailer park for violence, sh shocker, and the grounds of the trailer park were searched. Bridget and company started a Facebook group to spread the word. Now to this day, we don't know if she's alive, but most people assume she is not. 
Although Dorothy seems a little sketchy with the restraining order thing, we now know that Heather was the one who filed. And I know it's suspicious that she didn't contact the rest of her family about Fawn vanishing. But several reports and videos say Dorothy has a cognitive deficit that kind of explains this. As for Heather, she's looking more and more suspicious by the minute. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but Heather remodeled their trailer home shortly after Fawn went missing, redoing the floors and everything. This leads me to believe that she was covering up evidence. Heather then moved to Ohio, started dating a girl, and then moved back with her to Pennsylvania where they later got married. Possibly the most suspicious element of all is that Heather's family sold their butcher shop a few months after Fawn's disappearance. All of their equipment and tools were sold as well, and a lot of people suspect Fawn may have been murdered and mutilated with these tools and equipment. That would make sense as to why Fawn's body has yet to be discovered. Heather also lied several times about where Fawn was. She first claimed that she ran away, then said she was in prison in Arizona, and later told someone else that she was in prison in Ohio. I mean, nothing adds up here, and it's really frustrating that no major advancements have been made in a case that is now 10 years old. My hope is that with the new traction on social media, we can finally get down to the bottom of this and get answers and justice for Fawn's sake. Now, I will pass this to you. I mean, do you think that Fawn is still out there? I mean, if not, who do you think is responsible for her passing, and what do you think happened? Please be kind in the comments as this is a real person with mourning friends and family who may see what you write. So if you can, consider donating to their GoFundMe or simply share this video to inform more people. Guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Killer Bites. I'm Mac and we'll see you next time. The circumstances leading to Kat's death are incredibly suspicious and no one can seem to settle on one honest answer. Many believe it was an accident, while others think it was her own husband who did it. Kathleen Don West was born in Tampa, Florida on February 15, 1975. Everyone who was close to her called her Kat as it just fit her personality better. She was known by her friends as a bright ball of energy who was always the life of the party. Kat was a very free spirit who loved the attention and being seen. She felt very comfortable in her skin and was just overall a confident person. Despite all of this, she did struggle with depression and was seeking help for it. In 2004, Kat met a man named Jeff West. Jeff was in the military and worked as a recruiter. They met at a Super Bowl party and hit it off and started dating soon after. Jeff was attracted to many things about Kat, one of them being that she looked super similar to Marilyn Monroe. Kat was obsessed with Marilyn and wanted to update her look to match the part. The two got married in Vegas just four months after meeting each other. Once they tied the knot, married life started up and soon after, so did parenthood. In 2005, Kat gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, which the couple named Logan. Eventually in 2014, they settled in Calera, Alabama, where Jeff picked up a job working as a security officer at Birmingham Southern College. Things were going fine and their family saw how happy Kat and Jeff looked on their social media accounts. But there was a part of Kat that wanted to explore options. That's when Kat decided to start up an online subscription service through OnlyFans. Members subscribe to the creators they enjoy the most and pay to unlock exclusive content. The site also allows members to contact their favorite creators over a direct message board and even request specific services. She posted lots of photos of herself in suggestive poses, looking flirty and cute, wearing costumes and lingerie, and tons of people flocked to her page. Jeff was not only completely aware of what Kat was doing online, he was all for it. He was very supportive of her new endeavor and would help her, taking photos of her and posting them on her page. There was a point in time when Kat desired plastic surgery, and Jeff, once again, was totally supportive of it. So now, the evening of January 12th, 2018, Jeff and Kat left their home and went to a Papado seafood kitchen, where they enjoyed dinner and a couple of alcoholic beverages. After that, they left the restaurant and headed over to Red Zone Bar & Grill, where they had more alcohol. The two wrapped up their date night and decided to stop at a liquor store called r, r Wine and Liquor. Security footage shows the two being flirty and the vibes seemed to be great. When they got home, Kat changed into a pink bra and pink stilettos and asked Jeff to take pictures of her, to which he agreed. They continued to drink, having about six more beverages each and finishing off their bottle of absinthe. As the night progressed, the two started to bicker back and forth. Jeff got upset that Kat was spending a ton of time on her phone and not paying attention to him. After trying for some time to get her off her phone, he grabbed it out of her hands, opened the front door, and threw it. He decided the night was over and headed off to bed. Kat opened the front door to look for her cell phone and left the front door open. At around 5 in the morning, a neighbor from down the street came across a body. Next to the body was a cell phone with an empty bottle of absinthe balancing on top. Once the police arrived, it was clear that that was the body of Kat West. The cops started their investigation, looked at 
visit the area, gathered evidence, and went to speak with Jeff. That's when they gave him the news that his wife was deceased. Jeff didn't really react to the news. He seemed relatively calm. At first, it seemed like this was a pretty straightforward case. Kat had been drinking a lot, stumbled outside with a bottle, hit her head on the ground, and passed away. Her skull had been fractured, and her blood alcohol content was three times past the legal limit. However, when the investigators started looking closer, something seemed off. The bottle of absinthe was placed on top of Kat's phone, and it looked a little too staged. Jeff was brought back to the station for questioning, where he stayed for around six hours. The authorities also looked into the possibility that someone, specifically a member of her only fans, had stalked or harmed her somehow, but there was no evidence to suggest anything like that had occurred. Jeff was very cooperative during the interview and explained that he and Kat had been drinking the night before and got into an argument. He said he woke up when he heard the dogs barking and all the police commotion outside. However, this is believed to be a little shady and not entirely true. Apparently, the neighbor that called 911 saw Jeff pacing back and forth in the house while she called for emergency help. And the bottom of the bottle had a few splotches of blood and was missing a small piece of glass, which was never found. Jeff and Kat both had the health app installed on their phones, which tracked their steps and daily movements. On Kat's phone, it showed that the last time she moved was between 1045 and 1054 on January 12th, with a distance of 0.04 miles. No other movement was recorded except when police obtained the phone for evidence. Jeff's movements were tracked as follows. At 10.17 p.m., he took 10 steps. Then, he told the authorities that he went to bed around 10.30 p.m., but there was movement from 11.03 to 11.10 p.m., when he took 18 steps. In the morning, Jeff took 59 steps from 5.12 to 5.22 a.m. Those 59 steps, however, were unaccounted for. Further into the investigation, the police looked through old text messages between Jeff and Kat. Lots of nude photos were sent to Jeff from Kat, where he expressed delight in saying things like, looking good, hot mama. But eight days before her death, Kat had sent Jeff some interesting texts. She sent messages to Jeff saying, I know you're scared to tell me you don't want to be with me, but it's only hurting me more by lying. On Thursday, February 22nd, 2018, Jeff West was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife, Kat West. His bond was set at a whopping $500,000. The trial began and prosecutors were out in full force trying to pin this crime on Jeff. They said Jeff was angry because of the lack of attention he was receiving and that Kat's OnlyFans career made him jealous. When Kat went outside to grab her phone, he picked up the bottle of absinthe, followed her out, and struck her down. When the prosecution tried to say his reaction to his wife's passing was off, the defense team reminded them that Jeff was a trained soldier. Soldiers are trained to keep their emotions in check, even in the most stressful, terrifying situations. The defense claimed that Kat was drunk, fell down, which explains the first small pool of blood, got back up and collapsed again. She hit her head and that was it. It was all an accident. Then the parents of Kat and Jeff were called to the stand. Neither of them believed that Jeff was responsible for Kat's death. Nancy, Kat's mother, said he's a good man and he didn't do this. And I absolutely believe this with all my heart because I know what we went through after she passed away. He lived with me. We went to the funeral home together. We saw her body together. I saw him. You can't fake what he went through when we were all at the funeral home crying and saying that this can't be real. On November 20th, 2020, the jury concluded that Jeff West was guilty of manslaughter. Judge William Bostick sentenced Jeff to serve 16 years in prison. 